Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh oh yeah, oh yeah, here we and there I am, there I am, I appeared by magic. Here I am, here I am. Thank you, thank you everyone, it's great to be here, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. Hello everyone, my name is Chester Missing, I am your host for this wonderful day, but we need to start this properly. I know, it's weird, I look like a little man on your little TV set first thing in the morning. Good day to all of you, go to that comment section. Well, yeah, hello Paula, open up that comment section and say hello. I'm gonna come out and welcome myself. And this time I want you to give me a virtual round of applause and I, you know, I can't see you Bastard, so I need, I need to feel you in that comments. I need you to go there and just clap and cheer, just go absolutely nuts. I want you just, I want proper, just like the revolution has arrived. Like Julius has given everyone land, like Donald Trump fell off a rock and his wig went into a museum. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host for today, Mr. Chester Missing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Here we are, 
Here we are. There's Matilda Smith. Hello, Matilda Smith. Welcome. Have we your waha? Hello, washa. Okay, washa. Let's go. Washa. 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 Washa your mouth. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. My name is Chester Missing. We're going to have a fantastic day. I'm a puppet from South Africa to our international guests, Sao Borne, Dumelang, Dumela, Avisheni, and Da Goyedach. Hello. It's great to have you here. Uh, disrupt, decolonize, and develop. That's what we're here to do. Hashtag disrupt, decolonize, and develop. Uh, just, I know it's weird doing, uh, you know, Zoom meetings all the time. So you need to have some fun, guys. You need to have some. Molya, uh, Glenn, turn off your microphone. Turn off your camera if you're getting bored. Turn off your microphone, turn off your camera, and take your computer to the toilet. And then when the speaker starts, have a poo when they say hey how's it going everybody um uh, they're going great do you get the download I'm downloading right now focus on the results i don't want to if you're not laughing at this joke it's because you're unemployed by the way so it's great to be here hello pomeza uh, welcome koshala welcome if you've just arrived you're probably oh my gosh what is that little man doing on my computer screen international guests i know i look weird i look like vin diesel had a kid with benjamin button i know we've got people watching from uh from europe paula we've got people watching from javera watching from london and i know you guys have been struggling with they've got brexit there guys and have you heard about brexit that's where the british uh, decided to leave europe somehow i don't know how they pulled that off and during brexit actually germany phoned us uh dr christie germany phoned us oh in the dark here in the northwest of england Chris, uh, Dr. Chrissy, uh, the Germany actually phoned us during Brexit here in Africa. They said, hello, Africa, this is the Germans. We're very upset. And we're like, what's wrong, Germans? Uh, we are finding that the British are taking a very long time to leave. And we were like, uh, the, the British are taking a long time to leave. And yeah, they're taking a long time to leave. Said, we're like, uh, Germany, we're Africa. We know exactly what that feels like. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at my joke. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Javera. Thank you for laughing at my joke. Just I need to say hi. What? I need to say we're co-hosting. No, go down. No, no, go down. No. Help. Help. No, just no. Help. Hey, dude, I'm going to decolonize you. No, no. Hashtag develop. No, no, no. Dr. Paula. Just wait, bro. Hello, everybody. My name is Conrad Koch. Uh, I'm a South African uh, satirist and comedian. Uh, a lot of the people watching here will know Chester. Uh, well, I'm right here. I'm just saying. And I know these uh, events are difficult because there's always someone uh, in every uh, workspace, even something as awesome as opening up education, as important as it is, especially in uh, previously colonized states, um, uh, where education is such a function of wealth. 187 of the top 200 schools in South Africa are still in previously white areas as a function of wealth and race in South Africa, at least. And, and you know, but there's always someone in these groups, there's always what we call in Zulu, in Isi Puku Puku, uh, uh, or Setswana, we say Selela, uh, or, uh, you know, and, and it's like an a-hole, I don't know what the Afrikaans word for Steve Hoffman, there's always one. And it's very easy to spot, just look around, you look at the, the other people in the comment section, look there at uh, Dr. Chrissy, look at Gino. If you don't know who the Isi Puku Puku is, my friends, then it's you. So we're going to have some fun today. Please welcome back my good friend, Mr. Chester Missing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to get started. You guys ready for some energy? It's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to have such a fun day. We have an amazing lineup. It's going to be great. And you studied anthropology. It's part of why Chester and I talk about these e social anthropology. You know what that is, hey? That is Matilda. That is the study of white guilt. It even has the word apology in it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Could be an anthropologist on the on the school. Then they feel sorry for something. And of course, we're so excited to be working with Nelson Mandela University in Kadeha. 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 We love Kadeha. Kadeha. I love that name. Kadeha. Okay, bro. Kadeha. It sounds so dirty, doesn't it? Hey, do you want a Kadeha?
If you ask someone's sister to Kadecha, they would punch you. Hey, you want to go back to my place in Kadecha? The vice chancellor, uh, uh, Professor Mutu, is probably watching. Hey, Professor Mutu, hey, Kadecha. That's a rude, don't make it rude. It's not rude. I love it. That's, that's decolonizing, hey, because that was used to be called Port Elizabeth, the most colonized name in history. Now it's called Kadecha. Now racists can't go to Port Elizabeth. Racists can't go to PE. Hello, I'd like to go to Port Elizabeth. What do you mean they changed the name? No, don't start that rubbish name. I want to go Herrera. 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 Dead and send it to dead. <laughs> and of course, you know, I know it's been rough, guys, so we're going to have some fun. We're going to get into talking about how to take out. The, the history, how to deal with apartheid's legacy in education in South Africa and, quite frankly, colonialism globally, and particularly English colonialism. And because uh, it's been hard for all of us with lockdown, hasn't it? You can't go out. Every time you go into a shop, Natalda Smith, they're like, no mask, no entry. No mask, no entry. That's what they say. They say, no mask, no entry, which makes absolutely no sense because you get inside and nobody's wearing a mask. It's true. Nobody's wearing a mask. Yeah? That's like wearing a condom all day. It's like wearing a condom all day and then taking it off when you, you know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for laughing at my silly joke. So, guys, the way to make virtual events fun for everyone is use the comment section. We can't see each other, but if you're watching on YouTube, comment there. Let people know what you agree with. If you're laughing, use emojis. Come out and let yourself be expressed. That's one part of decolonizing these spaces is to shake up that reserved Western arrogance. So let's have so we're gonna have some fun. We're gonna have a huge amount of fun today. We need to decolonize. We all can, you can start today by decolonizing. What you do is you go out to a restaurant and go sit or go to a, a friend, go sit in a colleague's chair, preferably a white colleague. And then when they go, Hey, you stole my chair, go, no, no, I discovered it. Thank you. <laughs> this guy's an idiot. You're going to go down there. Yeah, because we've got to get this day started. We'll do some more comedy later. It's going to be a huge amount of fun. Make sure you get your friends to dial in. Let people know who need to hear about open, opening up education uh, to make it accessible to everyone. Are you ready? Go down. Go down. Now that, that is the revolution. Well, the white guy's got to get on his knees. You're also white. I know the white part of the white guy's hand in my ass. I'm basically the JSE. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bro, we're going to get going. Shush, I'm doing this. Okay, guys, I'm very excited to get up our person who's going to start the day off. We'd like to ask Professor Cheryl Foxcroft to turn on her microphone and camera. Prof Foxcroft, turn on your microphone and camera for us, please. Are you there? Turn your microphone on. It's, it's on mute. So it's on mute. That's the saying of 2021. Yes, hey, how's it? I'm um, yeah, I'm good. Thanks. And you? That's, I'm great. I'm great. I've got a guy's hand in my what what, but you know, it's uh, it's like being in education. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So Prof, uh, Prof uh, you are uh, the DVC for learning and, and teaching at Mandela University. What is a DVC? Because it sounds like a DVD, but with a C. <laughs> so it stands for Deputy Vice Chancellor. Oh, hey, I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor. That's very, yes. very important. Great to have you here. You helped the university to shift online. Uh, have you used more data than any of us? Well, I certainly used a hang of a lot, but probably our students used more. Absolutely. And that's what we're hoping for. You're going to talk to us, get the show going today. Are you excited about today? Very oh, much so. Amandla. Yes, I like that first there. Amandla. Thank you. Amandla. Amandla. Take it away, Prof. I'm going to disappear. Bye. Great. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. I'm going to put my video off um, to be able to save a little bit on my bandwidth. Um, and I've just got a couple of things I'd like to, to share with you this morning to kick things off. Um, there we go. We should be sharing now. Right. So 
I know that we're meeting each other in a virtual space today, but I thought that in welcoming you to the session that's hosted by Nelson Mandela University, I'll just give you a little flavor of a few of our campuses, which in time to come, you might want to visit. So the top two pictures are from our campus that's four hours drive away from Kobecha, um, and that is in George. It is set at the foothills of the Otaniqua Mountains, as you can see in the one picture, and it's actually set in a forest. So it's a fantastic campus to visit, have um, short learning courses there, for example, and so on. So I, I hope to welcome you there sometime. Then the bottom picture with the zebras is our Summer Strand South Campus, where we actually have a nature reserve. So I live in that uh, big building in terms of where my office is, that tall building you can see. Um, and I can look out of the window and I can see springboks and zebras roaming around. And if I look at the other side, I actually can see the sea. And sometimes there's some dolphins that I can see from my window. So a wonderful sight. But then the last picture, the bottom right, is that as a university, we are in service of society. And we have actually put our new medical school, which is the 10th one in South Africa, on our Mission Vale campus, which is in the middle of some very disadvantaged communities. And it shows our commitment to serving society, as well as, in fact, impacting on the ethos of our program. Our medical program is very community-based in its orientation. So that's just a little taste of our, of our campuses. Other than being in service of society, we also are very student-centered as a university with a, a strong social justice ethos. And as you know, to be able to be student-centered, you actually need information about your students because students and their needs change constantly as we've learned a lot during the pandemic. We have some national surveys that are done in South Africa to get information across the nation about our students. It's run through University of South Africa and it's run by the University of the Free State. And I want to draw on a few bits of information from this national survey as we talk about the importance of open education and open educational resources in our country and in the world. Now, in particular, in the last few years, they've added a financial stress scale to um, the questionnaires. And this is one of the bits of information I'd like to share with you. The question was, in the past year, were there any times that you ran out of food and could not afford to buy more? And as you'll see, in terms of the, the bar graph, 70% of our students experienced experience some form of food insecurity. Now that's a hang of a lot of students. And almost a quarter of our students, for them it's significant, it's most days or every day. And that has prompted universities to put in place various initiatives to be able to support students who can't afford to buy food, to be able to nonetheless get access to a meal, for example, at the moment, we're giving students a, a meal a day, a hot meal a day during the exam period, and so on. But the question that this then also poses to me is, so if students can't afford to, to buy enough food, what is happening in terms of buying learning materials and textbooks, for example? And maybe to contextualize things for our international guests, there's a national student financial aid scheme and that most students in fact at university now are on that scheme. It was particularly um, elaborated or, in, or enlarged during the fees must fall period so that more students could access university studies, particularly students who are from financially disadvantaged backgrounds. But in the scheme, students are actually given 4,000 rand for learning materials. To contextualize that for you, a student might be doing on average 10 modules in a year, and one textbook for one module could cost over 1,000 rand. In addition, 
students are allowed to use that 4,000 rand to buy a laptop. So I think you're beginning to get the picture of it's a small amount of money for a whole lot of things that need to be bought. And students are struggling, therefore, to actually afford to buy learning materials. And so this is another finding from the national study where you can see that two thirds of our students actually cannot afford and choose not to buy academic materials and learning materials because of their cost. And that obviously has quite a significant impact on student learning and student success. There's another finding, the last one I want to share, that when students were asked about the reasons that they would consider dropping out of university, 23% of them said that the cost of academic materials would be one of the reasons why they would drop out of university. That's quite a staggering statistic. So there's no doubt that if we stand for social justice, if we want all our students to have access for success and not just access to university, but access to succeed and to graduate, then certainly as a university and as a country and as the world, we need to be significantly ramping up the move to open educational resources and open education. Given those statistics I've given you, I can't in all good faith in my institution say we're doing everything to enable our students to be successful if I know that they can't afford the textbooks that we're prescribing. So we have to up the ante significantly and have many projects going to add to the open educational resource base, the open textbooks that are available to students. I know we're also hashtag decolonizing today. And this is a wonderful way to be able to decolonize education when students and lecturers together could be developing resources that are purposed for the countries in which they found themselves. So, and we would be saying Africa purposed. So I'm really looking forward to today and to see around open education and open educational resources. At Mandela Uni, we are very fortunate to have Gino Franzmann with us, who from day one has promoted, passionately, I would say promoted, um, open education and open educational resources. And he's very chuffed at the moment because Open Education Global have just given him an excellent award. So he is the 2021 Open Education Emerging Leader Award that he's been given. So we're very, very proud of Gino, I'm sure you'll be doing applause in the background there for Gino. But we also have many speakers today and many people who are participating, who are passionate about and work in the field of open education. So I'm looking forward to learning from you. I'll be back just later on. Um, Uh, prof, I think Cell C is getting in your way. Share a little bit of what I've learned towards the end. He's joined us, and I look forward to the day. Over to you. Halala, give it up, <laughs> Prof, for okay. prof for Foxcroft. That was great. We, we heard about half of that ending. Like, Vodacom tried to decolonize your voice for you, but we love it. Give a round of applause to Prof Foxcroft. Thank you. Thank you. Decolonize. Hashtag decolonize. Hashtag develop. Very exciting. Now, I'm very honored to be inviting uh, uh, two, two, the two next uh, panelists who are going to have a discussion. We're going to start off with uh, uh, Dave Jenkins. Dave Jenkins, are you there? Where are you? He's the Director of Learning and Development. And Gino Franzman, turn on your microphone and camera, Gino. We love you. Well done on that award. We're very excited. Come on, clap for him, Dave Jenkins. Clap for him. <laughs> Yes, Gino, we love you. We love you. Now turn on your Good microphone, you Gino. We love you. We love you. Very exciting. So, uh, Dave, uh, you moved from Cape Town to Quebec to George. Are you on the run? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like it. No, not on the run. Just and, uh, yeah. following my desire to serve students. 
I love it. Serve them. Serve them. Sounds like you need to focus on serving them food. But uh, you're Gino's boss. Is that true? Yes, I am. Oh, great. So how's therapy going? Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, so, so in the interest of decolonizing, can Gino have your job? I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. It's a joke. Gino, turn on your microphone, my friend. Turn on your microphone. Uh, well done uh, on that award, and thank you for putting together today. Everyone go to the comment section. I thank you, Gino. Thanks. Oh, you do amazing work, Gino. I've been following you for years. I'm very excited to be talking to you. Um, you were on Come, Come Dine With Me, South Africa. Is that true? Yes, it was, Chester. Did you win? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. No, I didn't. That. Much like this. <sighs> it, was it your piece? No, I, Tell us the truth. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that things went a, a, a bit skew. So they went skew. Yes, that's that. another word for peas. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Dave Jenkins, turn on your microphone. I'm going to let you guys talk. You guys are going to be discussing. Uh, you're discussing today, I think, uh, you know, Project Need for Open Ed Influences and Learning Development. Uh, welcome. So take it away, guys. Start talking. Do your powwow. Gino put on that fancy dishcloth looking shirt and, uh, and Dave didn't make any effort at all. So take it away, guys. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, I'll let you. Right, Gino, you first and then I'll follow you. <laughs> okay. So from my side, I'd just like to say welcome to everyone. Thank you. Um, Conrad, and thank you, Chester, for uh, what could perhaps be the best opening for open education in the history of open education, and certainly in the history of this university. I, I, I'm not shy to say, Dave is nodding his head. So, um, yeah, thank you, Prof, for a wonderful opening and for setting the tone. And um, from my side, I'd like to share my screen because what I want to do is I want to show everybody uh, what it is that we do here at the university. And um, that's why there's a video. And <laughs> I'm, I'm actually so nervous now because <laughs> this, is, this is such an amazing start. So thank you again, Conrad. Uh, and yeah, of course, I share without clicking on sound. So I shall go. Poncho, please don't hate me for all of this. And we go. Hello, my name is Gina Franzman. And I'm the founder and project leader of the Open Education Influences Project at Nelson Mandela University. What's the Open Education Influences Project all about? Let's ask some of the team. Hi there, I'm Anne Olsen and I'm an academic developer at Nelson Mandela University. Open education is very close to my heart, which is why collaborating on the Open Education Influences Project as a curriculum developer has been so rewarding. Hi, my name is Kelly Liberty and I'm an honor student studying in applied language studies with a focus on translation. Being part of the Open Ed Influences team has introduced me to the world of open. Every day I learn new things and I found my voice in the education system. Open Education Influences are ambassadors for open who increase use and awareness of open education resources. Hi, my name is Mlugis Msongo and I'm an accounting graduate from Nelson Mandela University. Becoming an open education influencer for me is important because I'm an ardent supporter of education and I believe that knowledge should be accessible to all. Open education is a great platform to create awareness for the available resources um, for those who are otherwise unable to receive quality education. Hi, my name is Intermesha Maseka and I am a doctoral student in public law at the Nelson Mandela University. As a budding researcher, I've come to realize that a core component of producing a quality outcome 
is access to high quality resources. Therefore, being an open education influencer is important because I'm part of a movement, a process, a philosophy of eliminating barriers to access. Open education influencers energetically advocate for the use of open textbooks across purpose, faculties and schools. Good day, my name is Matilda Smith. I am a legal practitioner at the Nelson Mandela University Law Clinic. I practice as an attorney and as a mediator. And then I also teach young aspirant legal practitioners how to practice. And of course, in so doing, I learn from them. I view open education and open educational resources as valuable to both staff and students because it improves access to education and educational resources. I was inspired by the open ed influences to start using and creating open educational resources. So now I feel obliged to advocate the use of open educational resources because not only is it good advice, it's basically a no-brainer. So that's our video and um, <clears throat> that's our video and I'm, I'm thrilled to say that Phil Hausler was um, responsible for that production and thank you Phil and thank you to Sia Pumalela and the Kresky Foundation for helping us to fund all of this. Over to you Dave. Uh, thanks Gina and thanks for all the organizing you've done and mine is really just to complete the welcome. I think we've been well welcomed by Conrad and Chester uh, if I look at our hashtags, to disrupt, to decolonize, to develop, they've certainly challenged us in that way. And that's been followed by what Prof Foxcroft has presented in terms of uh, some of the, the stats when you think about it in terms of, of education and why the need for open education is so important. And also something of what Gina showed of the program we have. So really, uh, it is to say welcome. I think if I look at those, those hashtags and I think about them, I wonder if we don't all perhaps feel like young and bold and uh, energetic students again crusading to change perhaps the world to make, make things different and as I look through the program today I see a program that does just that it gets us to think uh, it disrupts our thinking uh, it gets us to think about decolonize but certainly what I think it most does is it helps us to develop to go forward and to do something that can serve and provide our students with better resources so as we go through today's program that's what we look forward to hearing and being challenged by um, I, our hosts certainly are able to do that for us, uh, but not only are they able to do that, they're able to make us chuckle while we do that. And I think that's a wonderful gift to add to what we're doing today. So really a welcome to everybody from wherever you are in, in the world. A welcome to Quebec. Uh, we have changed our name, but I don't think we've changed one of our characteristics that we're the friendly city. And so we welcome you. We're sorry we can't have you here on our campuses, but we really do welcome you and we hope you feel welcome. We hope you enjoy the program. We hope you take something away from this that will make your work different. So thank you and over to our hosts again. Thank you very much. Chester, sound? It's my, whoa, 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 there we go. Okay, sorry guys, I was being a stupid bastard. Sorry, this is my impression of, uh, of Dave Jenkins there. Hello everybody, how's it going? So the next time I speak up sooner, Gino, don't worry about interrupting me. I'm a puppet, but you work at a university, so you know what that feels like. Uh, so Dr. Wayne McIntosh, are you on the call? He's phoning all the way from New Zealand. So uh, he's probably speaking from across the ocean. Turn on your microphone, dude. What time is it there? Is it like four? What time are you, bro? Uh, not 
not not too bad. Eight eight thirty in the evening. I hope you oh, can hear me. Are you um, fine. I can hear you. Uh, I, more importantly, I can see those enormous earphones. Yeah, I, I'm I'm listening well. Um, one bit of advice: we've seen the future that's already happened, and um, you guys are going to have an amazing Wednesday. Oh, that's amazing! See, he's got a New Zealand joke. Give him a round of applause. Thank you, New Zealand joke. He knows what it's like the day before the day. What a genius! I love it, Dave. Uh, so, uh, uh, Wayne, so Dr. Wayne McIntosh, uh, you are going to talk about uh, radical openness. Uh, why are you wearing clothes? Oh, well, just because it's cold here in the deep south. Uh, other than that, um, no real reason. Yeah, that's right. Decolonize your nipples. Listen, you're in you're in New Zealand. Can you please send us some electricity? No, uh, not today, but uh, we, we can't even send you lessons in rugby. So what can oh, there I we go. Got rugby jokes. Thank you. There. Love it, Dave. Love it. Love it. Love it. Listen, um, I'm very excited about what you're going to talk about today, a sustainable model to achieve open education for all. I'm going to hand over to you. Take it away. Give it up for Dave McIntosh. Oh, so I'm calling you Dave now. For Wayne, Dr. Wayne McIntosh. Thank you. Bye. So in theory, my screen should be coming through now. Uh, what I'm hoping to ch chat about is uh, radical openness, uh, but not radical in the sense of a, a revolution, but radical in terms of the original Greek meaning of the, uh, uh, the concept, which is going to the roots of uh, education um, and how we use open strategies entirely in providing free and open access to education in, uh, in, uh, uh, around the world. So let's, uh, let's move forward. I thought we'd begin with a thought experiment. Is it possible for an institution uh, to, um, to offer uh, online courses to support 10,000 learners uh, for the cost of a weekly meal for two? So what I did today is I, I went and had a look at the uh, Wimpy website uh, to find out what the costs of um, uh, meals are in South Africa these days. And I can see that you could buy a, a Wimpy burger combo uh, for uh, 76 Rand. And uh, if you multiply that by two, uh, it's 153 Rand 80, you know, 615 Rand a month if you were to go every week for a meal. Uh, translate that to U.S. dollars, uh, it would cost you 39 uh, U.S. dollars a month. We recently ran an experiment creating a, a digital ocean droplet in the cloud, which is an open source infrastructure, a hosting solution, uh, plus a... Um, slides are uh, jumping vigorously around, uh, so we'll just go back to where we were. Uh, plus hosting a WordPress multi-site, which you can do for 36 US dollars a month. And we recently ran an open online course in collaboration with the Commonwealth of Learning uh, to well over 1,500 teachers across the Pacific region, uh, providing access to open online courses uh, for 36 dollars a month. And we carefully monitored the the server statistics and the server was operating at well below 10% of its capacity. And we confidently predict that it is possible to offer open online courses uh, for as little as 36 uh, US dollars a month, uh, up to 10,000 learners. So an interesting proposition for us to be thinking about as we move forward using uh, open technologies across the board. And my central premise is this, there's no form of educational delivery that is more cost effective, more scalable, or more sustainable than open education. So a little bit of context in terms of uh, the work I do and where I'm situated. I work full time for the OER Foundation, which is an independent nonprofit organization that provides governments and institutions uh, networking and support in achieving their strategic objectives using open educational resources and free and open source software technologies. 
We also host the UNESCO chair in OER uh, in this part of the world. I should also point out in terms of our smart philanthropy, uh, we offer free membership to our flagship initiative, the OER Universitas, to institutions in the developing world from low and uh, from low and middle income countries uh, to join the network entirely for free. We base entirely on open source and free technologies. So a little bit of background in terms of how does the OER Universitas work. Our key driving force and reason for existence is to widen access to educational opportunity. And as you will hear from my delightful Kiwi accent, I do have some experience of living and working in South Africa. Uh, in this time and age, we know that the majority of South African youth will not have the privilege of access to higher education. Uh, if, I know, uh, if I can recall correctly from the statistics, Roughly, the gross enrollment uh, ratio in South Africa is around about 17%. So clearly, the majority of uh, South African youth are not going to have the privilege of a tertiary education. Moreover, as we face the challenges in a post-COVID -pan uh, post pandemic world, uh, recent reports from UNESCO uh, indicate that two-thirds of poorer countries have had substantial cuts to their budgets to education in terms of moving forward. So we're facing interesting challenges as we move forward. The concept of the work that we're doing at the OER Universitas is a simple uh, proposition. We can build open online courses based entirely on, uh, on OER. And that means we can provide free access to learners to study uh, university level courses at no cost whatsoever. Uh, through smart use of technology, we can provide uh, student support through uh, community service uh, initiatives on a pathway leading to uh, institutions being able to offer assessment services uh, on a cost recovery basis for learners to gain credible qualifications. So a little bit in terms of how our systems work, uh, we assemble open online courses based entirely on open educational resources. Uh, we assemble all our courses as a series of micro courses. And as you can see there, one of our most popular courses is the Learning in the Digital Age course, which comprises four micro courses, which of course opens up opportunities for learners to achieve micro credentials uh, with pathways to achieve formal university credit to uh, formal university qualifications. But where the real magic happens is in terms of how we support learning in a digital age. Um, we have a philosophy that uh, it's, it's best to support learning using the internet as uh, the, the, the technologies for delivery. And in life, there are some skills which are which may be uh, at, uh, at face value seem relatively easy to acquire, but in reality are quite hard to learn. And so you can think about learning to ride a, a, a push bicycle uh, in the early phases of your experience. Uh, it's hard to strike your balance and some skills uh, you need to learn by doing. Um, you're not going to learn how to ride a bicycle by reading a book. And so our philosophy is to help learners to learn on the internet using the tools of the internet rather than a single application like a learning management system. So our uh, OERU learning environment, as I've said, comprises entirely uh, and is powered entirely from free and open source uh, learning technologies. Our course materials are published on uh, the, the, the WordPress uh, open source content management system. We use an, a number of best of breed free and open source technologies for learner interactions, including technologies like Discourse for course forums, Mastodon, which is our social media platform, uh, an alternative for Twitter, 
Many of you will be familiar with the open source web annotation uh, technology hypothesis where learners can uh, comment and uh, annotate any pa uh, web pages on the open internet, as well, of course, our WordPress platform that is used for publishing our course websites. And, and through the use of a number of smart open source scripts, we are able to aggregate interactions that are distributed across the internet via these various technologies into a single um, a Twitter-esque like a course feed for learners to be able to interact with each other. And as I've illustrated, we uh, use a range of free and open source uh, software interaction technologies. Um, Mastodon learners, uh, instead of using an e-portfolio system, learners can maintain uh, their own blog websites where they retain access and control to the content that they're producing. We have an internal uh, commenting engine, which uh, is powered by Wiki Educator Notes, a bit of software we developed mm -hmm. ourselves. Uh, as I've said, web annotations using Hypothesis. Uh, we use another piece of open source uh, technology called Semantic Scuttle um, for social bookmarking. And of course, discourse for um, a discussion forums. And the, the, the real power of this is that any learner that engages in learning through the OERU digital learning ecosystem is not at any point required uh, to give away personal data by creating accounts on corporate websites uh, that are into uh, surveillance capitalism. From the authoring side, um, we author all content uh, using MediaWiki, which, uh, as many of you will know, is the software which powers uh, the Wikipedia website. And the big advantage of using a Wiki engine on the back end means that we have strict version control for collaborative authoring and development of course material. And so we could have uh, uh, content uh, subject matter experts in South Africa collaborating with learning designers in Namibia and interactions from others across the world. Uh, all collaborating on the same uh, wiki pages. And from a collection, uh, an outline of wiki pages, we have open source technologies that you can request a snapshot that would then publish to a WordPress website that learners can access. And getting back to our uh, original slide, this is technology that could be hosted by anyone for 36 uh, um, US dollars a month that can uh, easily serve up to 10,000 uh, learners without a problem. So um, in, in, in closing, I hope there will be an opportunity for some discussion. I uh, promise to keep my uh, presentations short. Um, while many institutions uh, in higher education believe in expanding affordable access to learning uh, through their co community service missions, uh, but what is difficult for institutions to deliver individually, in fact, becomes possible through active participation in using radically open solutions uh, in the network scenario. So let me leave it there. Hopefully I've managed to stay within my time limits. And if there are any questions, I'm not sure how you're wanting to deal with those. Uh, happy to respond. Thank you very much. Halala, halala, Dr. Wayne. That was great. We loved it. Very good. We, we've got a whole lot of questions. We're going to have a question answer session in a short bit of time. So if you're able to hang around, that would be really helpful. I love it. I love your massive earphones. I love your massive ideas. Thank you. Big round of applause for Dr. Wayne McIntosh. Okay, you can turn your vibes off. Thanks, Dr. Wayne. Uh, okay, guys, listen, I, I need to say, come up here. Come up here. What? Well, I mean, you know, we're talking all about decolonizing, so I've got some questions. I've got some questions for you, white guy. What do you want to ask me? Are you racist? Well, we, can, what do you, we can't talk about decolonizing unless you start a self-reflection. Are you racist? You can't ask me that here. But did you see how he looked around? Did you see how he looked around like that? Did you see? That's what we do, isn't it, white people? The moment we talk about race, we start looking around like a mere cat checking for snakes. And then we say some crazy racist crap, like, I'm not racist, but I'm not racist, but. 
So what are you trying to, you can't say anything after the sentence, I'm not racist. Like you never ever seen anyone say to their wife, honey, I would never, ever, ever, ever kiss your sister. But, <laughs> okay, bro. No, I'm not, I'm not racist, guys. You know, I've really thought, I'm, I'm very liberal from, from Cape Town. Yes, he's from Ronda Bosch in Cape Town. They are Ronda Bosch. If Ronda Bosch was a sound, it would be air. <laughs> Ronda Bosch is there, but air. If you know Ronda Bosch in Cape Town, it's it's liberal white people. Air. It's a sound you make if your cheesecake is stale. Air. They're liberal kind of, you know, dude, you're freaking. They're, they're the kind of people who complain about the temperature of a cappuccino to a dude who lives in a shack. Now, cappuccino is cold. Yeah, that is your toilet on the inside. Yeah. So screw you. <laughs> it's true. No, we're sort of liberal kind of white people. They don't think they stole the land. They think Dan Golding did. Hey, that's why they put UCT on a hill. So you could learn to look down at everyone from an early age. That's not true. Dude, what does someone from UCT say when they need someone from UWC? I don't know. Err. <laughs> Bro, no, I'm not, okay, so are you racist? I'm not racist. Are you sure? Yeah, cuz come on, bro. Most of my friends of color, my family's of color, you know, I've got more than half my family. Oh, you see what he's doing now? But this is what we do, isn't it? The moment that we start talking about race, we start quoting our race see the I'm not racist. I'm not racist. I had a black friend. His name is mm, 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 mm. Jeremy, he's my friend and he's my gardener. It's a complicated relationship. <sighs> this is a difficult conversation, my friends. I know that. Dude, it's insane. Hey, that's it. And my problem is I can't smile because all that I do when I try smile is that. That is an ugly face. Yeah, that is a face the queen makes. If you say the words, Megan Markle. Okay, bro. <laughs> Did you guys see that interview talking about decolonizing uh, with Prince Harry and Oprah. Hey, did you see that interview? That's how the Queen talks. Air, oh, hello, hello, hello. That's how she talks. Hello. That's how the Queen talks. Did you see that TV show on Netflix, The Crown? Hello. Because she's got all she's got all Africa's gold stuck in her thrickin' nose. Hello, hello, air. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, that's, you know it's true. Okay, there was a weird interview with Harry and Oprah, and apparently the Queen asked, she said, Harry, 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 what color, what color will it be? She asked about the little baby. Yes, what color? Why is she asking that stupid question? Why didn't she ask a more important question? What's that? Why would you call the son of the red-haired dude Archie? If he comes to Africa, we'll just call him Archie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, they're saying the royal family's racist. Of course the royal family's racist. Have you seen the Queen's crown? It's literally got Africa and India's jewels in it. Like it's take a genocide to work day. The Commonwealth. That's what they call it. The Commonwealth. How do you steal a country and call it the Commonwealth? That's like mugging someone and then going sharing is caring. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, the world is moving on. No, it's not. Australia, I don't know if you guys know this. Australia still celebrates Australia Day. It's a real Australia Day. They celebrate the day every year that the English colonized Australia. That's an a-hole move. It's weird. That's like hijacking someone's car and then calling them every year to remind them that you've got it. <sighs> Good night, mate. Yeah, it's us. Yeah, we still got it. Yeah, yeah, right. Same time next year, you bastard. You know it's looking crazy. Okay, dude. Sheldon. Right, Sheldon, this is the whitest dude you've ever seen in your life. No, we're doing a, f a Zoom conference. I'm going to show them. Sheldon, just check this. Cover your eyes, Gino. It's going to blind you. Sheldon. Go back, Sheldon. This is he's this guy's the whitest dude. Why are we doing it? Well, of course, the people of color get objectified all the time. Come on, white man. It's your turn. Decolonize. Come on. This right. Do it. <sighs> Holy cock, did you see that? Look at that. Did you see that? Look at that, Matilda. Okay. Bro, hey, Dr. Wayne, if Dulux sold that as a color, do you know what they'd call it? No. Air. It's a kind of white that comes with its own country club and then the shutters. You know, it's true. Where's the hair? Well, I got. Never mind. Where's the hair? You used to have hair. It got. Did it get looted? No, it didn't get looted. I got. I got laser hair removal. Laser hair removal. Hey, laser hair removal. That's insane. There are starving kids just down the road in Kadeja. Literally, they got the stats, and you got laser hair removal. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I got a little. Does it go all the way? What? 
you can't ask me that in the end. Just answer them. In the... Does it go all the way? Don't ask that question. We want to know the facts. Does it go all the way? No, it doesn't go all the way. <gasps> so up here, you're like a freaking dolphin down there. Wolverine. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you for laughing at my silly joke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We all need to fight racism. I think the point the chest is trying to make. Yes, we all need to fight racism. Black people, you need to help us. You need to go out to white people in Woolworths and go, do you work here? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda Moster. Thank you. We're going to get on with our next speaker. Okay, go down. Go down. Go back down. There we go. That's where you belong. Okay, listen. Uh, we, we, I'm very excited about this next speaker. Uh, it, it, she's a professor from UNISA. Prof uh, Makwe, are you on the call? Please turn on your microphone and camera. Prof Makwe, where are you? I'm here. I'm here. How's it going? I'm fine, thanks. And you? I'm very nice. Thank you. I like your big necklace. Don't let Julia see it. He will expropriate <laughs> your neck. <laughs> You'll be nationalized. Uh, listen, such an honor to be talking to you. Uh, you a distinguished professor in open and distance learning. And I, I heard that you believe the best helping hand you can give someone is often a firm push. Is that true? Yes, yes. Are, are you like, do you train people in bungee jumping? Yes. Go! Oh. Ah! Uh, I, yeah, I understand. You're the Commonwealth Learning Chair in Open Education Resources. What does that mean? Because Commonwealth Chair makes it sound like you're giving the Queen lessons. Hello, I'm a Commonwealth Chair. <laughs> no, being a Commonwealth of Learning Chair is that I, I, I promote open education resources in all the countries that were formerly colonized by, by the British. Amanda, a CG kid. Yeah. Very good. I'm very excited about that. I'm excited. You're going to be talking about reimagining an open education for the future. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Everyone give uh, Prof Professor Mpine Markwe a huge round of applause. Bye. Okay. Hello, colleagues. I'm, I'm trying to share my presentation now. Um, Good morning, colleagues uh, from Kebeja. And, and this is such a pleasure. And thank you so much, Gino, for your kind invitation. And, and I just looked at you and I looked at Wayne and I said, it looks like it's a, a UNISA thing here. Uh, Gino, once upon a time, was at UNISA and so was Wayne. And this is a very proud moment for me, Gino, for your, for your um, award that you received. And, and, and being an open education influencer. And this is something that comes way, way, way back. When we, when we talked in my office, I think it was 2011 or 2012, but it was a long, long time ago. But I'm, I'm very happy for you. My presentation will look at reimagining an open education for the future. I'm a Commonwealth of Learning Chair from the University of South Africa. And as you know, uh, the University of South Africa is one of the largest distance education university in, in the world. And I always say that we are the grandmother of, of the universities in South Africa, as well as the grandmother of distance education in the world. Because um, UNISA is the first university to provide courses a university courses formally um, in an online space. I know that other people are fighting for that, but it's but we know who we are. So we, we, we are fine with that. Um, I'm going to start with what education is, because sometimes when we are in higher education and we are busy with what we are doing, we forget that we are involved in this space of teaching and learning because education is a fundamental human right and an enabling right. And um, being an enabling right, we know some of us who live in this country that without education, there's very little that allows you 
to participate actively in the economy. If you have to be honest, you, if you want to be an honest citizen. Education also is a common good and a public good. It's, it's a right that all of us need to have. And it's a right where all of us can enable other people to access, enable other people to, to perform it. And it's a public good because anything that is produced with public funds have to be made accessible to all and sundry. And, um, and it also ensures equitable access to life opportunities. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Otherwise, we wouldn't be pushing to be in, in higher education. Um, African continent, the, the, in the continent, there are so many uh, students who want access into higher education. And unfortunately, many of them cannot have access into higher education due to space shortages, due to a whole lot of other things, uh, money, um, shortage of space, and, and also the education system that we inherited is elitist in nature. And by elitist, it meant that only a few can have access to higher education. Hence, we find ourselves in a situation where we have to play this catch-up role of trying to get as many people as possible in the education space. And once we widen participation into higher education, then issues of quality come in, where people claim that there is no, it's not possible to have a lot of people coming into higher education without, um, without good quality. And now you wonder what quality means, but that's a story for another day. Now, education fundamentally is about sharing. We, we, we don't start with education when we, go, when we start school. We start with education right at the beginning of our lives. And we share information, we share knowledge, we share insights. And this is how we learn from each other. We don't necessarily learn from books or any other place, but we also learn from each other. So education has been often associated with formal training that it has removed the fundamental way of how to learn right at the beginning. And, and because we learn from each other, education, we have turned the education sector into something that only those who can afford will be able to share the, in, in the education system, will be able to participate in the education system. Now, my, my presentation really, it's about the future, looking at the future and not necessarily ignoring the present. And part of the reason that I'm doing that is that I had found in many of the work that I have done that, um, policies in the past, especially post-colonial policies uh, in different countries in the continent have indicated that um, they, they, they have shown education and especially distance education as the only way that they can use to address issues of, um, to address issues of, 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 of development. And you know that even to this day, um, education countries in the continent are still battling with development issues. They're still battling with economic growth. And, and part of the reason is that education has, has not been visualized and they have not envisioned ed education as a developmental tool. So when colonizers left in the 60s in other countries, and in, in South Africa very recently, and um, an apartheid system, we did not take time to envision what our education system should look like. We just inherited the education system that we had, and we continued with it without questioning it. It's only recently when uh, students forced us to look at this uh, colonized type of education system that we begin to talk about hashtag decolonizing education system. But for years, we were continually going through what we have learned, we, and by we, I'm talking about the mature uh, group of people who are teaching now, 
we were continuing with, with the way we were taught and teaching the generation that may not function in the world that we are functioning in. Now, the second part is the economic growth. Um, statistics have shown that if there's low uh, higher education participation rate in a country, the likelihood of that country to grow economically is very minimal. In Africa, for an example, there are countries that have 5% higher education participation rates to a point of some have 2% higher education participation rate. And those are the poorest of the poor. South Africa with 17% participation rate is the highest in the continent. And even that is still considered the lowest when you are looking at other countries, developing countries that look more like, like, like it. So we need to deal with that. The third one, which we always neglect in the higher education space, and, and when we teach, we always say that we teach for economic activity um, so that people go into the world and, and do and, and participate in an, in, in an economic activity. But we found that a majority of people with our qualifications leave the universities without proper um, training into those economic activities that we claim that we are teaching for. Social cohesion is one of the critical parts. We come from a very, very hateful and a difficult past of colonialization, of apartheid system, and part of the reason that we are here and part of the message and the information that we, we needed to share immediately after, after we came out of apartheid was social cohesion. And there are very few courses, if any, in our context, in our, in our universities that deals with this. So we educate for the future in the continent because of the development needs, economic growth, and social cohesion. Now, I want us to take just a few minutes a few minutes, uh, you close your eyes, and we don't think about all, um, all what is going on right now. We don't think about what is going on, the challenges. I don't want us to think about the challenges. I want us to dream a little bit and dream about the community of 2050 and how would that look like in 2050? And, and tell me how that community in your view will look like. And what type of social and economic activities would people be engaged in during that time? And in 2050, it's, we are not talking about what we are doing here. And, and if you, you may um, indulge me a little bit, just write on the chat, what is it? What is it that you want to see in 2050? And this is what visioning means. Uh, when you vision, you don't vision for tomorrow. You don't vision for 10 years from now. Your vision, you really throw the pebble in the, in the, in the sea where you vision for, for 20, 30, 30 years, or even 50 years. So all I want us to do is just to think about that. And as we are thinking about that, how would higher education look like? The one that needs to support the social and economic and political activities that ideally we would like to engage in. What type of an environment? Right now we are being told about the global warming and, and, and all, the, all, the, all the repercussions that comes with it. We are in the middle of the heat wave and part of the reason is the global warming. And if we continue with the practices that we are continuing with today, would that help in the future? We live in an arid country, but very little is said about how we con con conserve water. And, and I mean, it's, it's one of the critical, critical things, but yet we are not thinking about it and coming back to how we inherited the colonial education system uh, that comes from, we were colonized by British. And in Britain, water is not a problem. Water is everywhere. And therefore, there will be no cause about water. There will be no need to teach people how to conserve water. And to this day, we still have no 
idea or want to do those things. You'll get um, some TV commercial here and there, but it is not something that is taught deeply. Now, I'm doing this because um, as I was introduced as a, as a scholar, uh, you have to come up with research methodologies. And uh, we are looking at futures research methodology, which is the methodology that I want to promote as we are dealing with openness. And uh, maybe you are wondering that I'm talking so long, but I'm not getting to openness. Um, the part of the reason is that I also want to promote the future that we want to anticipate, the future that we aspire for. So as we envision the ideal world, that like the exercise that I've asked you, we need to start creating strategies for that ideal world. We need to look at those features that we need to strengthen, you know, and, and threats that need to be eliminated, as I had mentioned. Um, if we continue with the colonized type of education system, we will continue without addressing our own development needs. And we need to come up and then the most important thing, we need to articulate um, what the, our desirable future should look like in order to, to come up with it. So we, these will be guided by our current decisions. The decisions, that visual visualization that you've just come through. And, and I would really indulge you to go forward with it. Now, um, the reason that we are involved in the futures methods is that it helps us to look at all the things that we can avoid, things that we can dist uh, uh, strengthen, and opportunities that we can ad ad and identify and build on. And which future really do we wish to become? a reality for higher education sector. Now, I looked at a lot of work, uh, literature on the, on, the, on, on the futures. And it is no doubt that virtually every other study has said that higher education is likely to be open, is likely to be digital, it's likely to be personalized, it's likely to be co co collaborative, and it also likely to be diversified. So when we look at openness, openness goes hand in hand with digitalization. You need to be digitalized. digitalized. And what um, COVID has taught us is that education is a personalized entity. And uh, Professor Foxcroft Croft talked about education as student-centered. If we want to do what needs to be done, we need to address the student needs. We need to go to the level of doing that. And also, it, and, and during COVID, we were forced to work collaboratively as universities, as, as as individuals, wherever we are. And, and we haven't reached the level of diversifying cultural and epistemic diversity, but this is where we need to go. And this is part of the results that are coming through in many, many other literature that whatever that we do, education is going to be open. Now, every open education deals with resources, learning material, research, data and this is actually what helped us during COVID with open data that all of a sudden scientists didn't have to sit in the corner on themselves without trying to share data with each other in order for them to come up with certain things the vaccine um, in the past, pandemics used to take a very long time before they can come up with vaccine because it was just this individual who was sitting at the corner trying to work out what is it that they can do to assist people. But now, uh, in this era of technology, in this era of openness, scientists were encouraged to open up their data so that other people can take it forward. So this is the core of the sharing of what we mean by openness. Openness also is about tools and the open source software that allows us to communicate without having to pay for us to get involved. Zoom, for an example, if you want that 30 minute Zoom, you don't pay for it. 
you can still con connect and communicate with people. And, and there are a lot more of other open source software that um, Wayne talked about in, in, in his presentation. And he talked a lot about the learning material, the open resources and how, how we can use them because that's, they are there and they are available. During COVID, I used a course that was, um, that was developed by, by OERU. Uh, Wayne's, Wayne's organization. And, and that course helped a lot of teachers who were forced to go online without even having the basic knowledge on how to do it. So that, that is what you do. You pick up a resource somewhere else and, and, and you, 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 you work with it. Um, I, I, as I said, I work with UNIS at UNISA and many people at UNISA always say that if you share your resources, um, what about um, uh, intellectual property rights? And I said, students have been doing this for years. One student buys the material and all of them photocopy from that. And this particular student really runs a photocopy mill with, with whatever that is, that with, with the material that he has. Students don't buy learning material. We, we, we think, if we think that students are buying learning material, we are, we are fooling ourselves. They get material from each other. And now in time, in the days of technology, they don't even have to go that route. They can get, download material and use it. And, and this also, what I have learned also uh, during this process of looking at open education and why people are not engaging, especially teachers or lecturers or professors are not engaging in it, is that they don't understand what this means in practice. And, and they are very, remember, we are going against a 400 year history of a closed system that has never allowed anyone whom they don't think is qualified to stand in front of a class and talk. Now we are saying students have to create information, share teaching practices and all those things. And this is not done in an elite type of a system. And the, the biggest hurdle is the institutional practices. Institutional practices don't have open policies and strategies and the network participatory scholarship, they talk about it, but they are actually not promoting it. So if we go back and look at what type of policies do we have as an institution? It's something that will assist us to move forward with the, 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 the openness that we aspire for. Now, openness in a nutshell is about flexibility, lifelong learning, student-centeredness, accessibility, equitab equitability, and inclusivity. The, three, the, the, the last three talks directly to the social justice framework and the social justice principles. These are the principles that need to address issues that had been there, the injustices that are created by economic, the redistributive injustices, who gets access to what because of their ability to pay for access. So open education principles, according to Fraser, Hodgkinson, Williams, and Trotter, and Labert, these colleagues are from the UCT. They came up with open education principles that are linked to the social justice principles. And remember, we are here to address the injustices of the past. And we cannot do that without addressing those issues that created it. The economic justice that actually remove or, or exclude those people who do not even have food. Um, uh, Prof, Prof Fox, Foxcroft was talking about that. If they cannot feed themselves, how else can be they be able to pay tuition, to, 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 um, to buy study materials and all those things? And then there is cultural. What, the, the one that I talked about, that it is epistemic cultural diversity. If we do not see ourselves, if students cannot see themselves within the curriculum, they cannot decolonize what this curriculum, they cannot see what this curriculum say to them. That curriculum is not including them. 
So it is important for us to see ourselves within the curriculum. So the challenge is, is with professors and lecturers to start developing materials where students can start recognizing themselves if we want to address the social injustices of the past. And, and equitability, it's, it's actually the representation of, of, of people within the system itself. And it's not only about the numbers of or changing demographics or any of that. It's also about how you are represented and at which level and what type of power do you have? Because remember, politics is about power play and, and what type of power is, is allowed. Then the, the, there's a digital one, the, the one that I've included, I think, now after COVID, where people could not engage in, with each other if they do not have access to the, the, the technologies that are expected. Connectivity was one of the major problems that we need to push government. This, this has to, to, to be addressed by the politicians and government itself. And that was a major problem. Then you have issues of, of costs also was a major, major problem as well. So all of this did not give participation. There was parity of uh, open education principles allow for parity of participation that all people, irrespective of all the things that they do not have or do have, can be able to participate in open education. Now, the social justice framework deals with these two principles, equality and equity. And this picture shows you the differences between equality and equity. And in this country, we know that at one point, everything was opened for us to, to run the race. But what was, not, um, what was not looked at is that we are not starting from the same playing field. We are starting at different playing fields. So if you start from different playing fields and you are not um, supporting students who come from disadvantaged environment, from those students who, have, who did not participate in higher education, then you are neglecting a big part of the students and you are, by excluding them in participating, uh, you are excluding them from participating because you are not supporting them to function in this world that is completely foreign to those students who have been excluded in the past. So our role as institutions, we must make sure that universities are open to everybody, not for those that have had, uh, that, that had the advantages in the past. Now, we need to strive for an education system that is inclusive, equitable, accessible, and that enables parity of participation to achieve the education we want. And this is what openness is all about. So the aim of this whole thing is to start rethinking about the vision and mission of higher education. What is it? Who are we? What is it that we want to do? And if education system in the future is going to be open, it's going to be collaborative, it's going to be digital, it forces us really to rethink. And unless we do that, we will never be able to move forward. We need to redefine our role in relation to the social justice mandate. We have a social justice mandate to, to deal with as, as, as higher education. And we have to repurpose this higher education in a workable solution. So this is what we require in order for us to get to the future we aspire for. Our moral responsibility as academics is not to stop the future but to shape it, to channel our destiny in humane directions and to ease the trauma of transition. And that we can do if we start opening the doors of education and opening up teaching and learning and opening up all the policies that we have in higher education. And this was said by Alvin Toffler, who came up with this um, quote and one of the futurists of our time. Thank you, colleagues, for listening and giving me the time to dream with you. Thank you. Halala, Prof. Makwe, that was brilliant. I love it. Give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. We love it. Yes, decolonize that stuff. Thank you. Thank you. 
I mean, the fact that we're even doing this conversation in English is a legacy of colonialism. Ngiamonga, Nkosi, Bayadanki. Guys, listen, um, you know, I, we should all learn a little bit of Zulu. We should all learn, or any African language. Zulu. To laugh in Zulu, you go uku to play in Zulu, you go uku tlala. So what do you say if you're really bad at something in Zulu? Anyone in the comment section? What do you say if you're really bad at something? You say, bafana, bafana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. We're going to get along with the day. Uh, I'm very excited to bring up our next speakers. Thanks, Prof. You can turn off your mic and camera. We're going to get our, our next speaker. We're going to ask you to stay for the question and answer. I'm sure a lot of you got lots of questions about how to apply what the Prof was saying. Um, so uh, next up, we've got, um, uh, I'm very excited to have two speakers. We'd like to ask Leo Haverman and Javera Atanas to turn on your microphones and cameras. Hey, hello. Leo and Javera, how's it? Dr. Javera, how's it going? Hey, hello. hello. Hi, how are you doing? Good to see you all. I'm very well, very well, very well. Other than the fact that I live in Cape Town or the white guy's hand in my what what. So I am the most colonized guy on the whole show. Uh, but you guys are in London, so <laughs> maybe not. Uh, listen, um, uh, Leo, you grew up in Canada and Australia and New Zealand. Are you and are you virtually in South Africa? Are you just touring places the British stole from? It, I seem to be, yeah. But um, you know, it's um, uh, it, of course, you know, um, only places where people speak English because I can't really speak other languages. The Gempel and Gempel, I understand. Well, Cape Town, they do the same, uh, unbelievably. And I see you now in space, so that's where we're sending Elon Musk. Apparently, you used to work uh, with blueberries, it said, when they, your bio said, oh, you work with I don't know what that meant. Were you a, a dealer? You're like, hey, 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 do you want no, to buy some I blueberries? Used to, I used to um, grade the blueberries. I had to remove all the, all the crushed ones and the ones that weren't ripe enough and the ones that had stems attached. Um, and um, and pack them um, and puree them as well. Wow, you look like and you're really, hiding really next to a huge eat them blueberry. After that, you couldn't eat them for like years. I can yeah. imagine that must have been a traumatic experience. <laughs> uh, that is how white privilege works. I'm joking. I'm joking. It's a joke. Uh, let's go over to Javira. How's it going? It's fine. It's fine. How are you doing? Uh, I'm great. I'm very excited. Uh, uh, now, they told me that you are a senior lecturer in learning and teaching at Suffolk. Uh, you're, uh, you're, you're obsessed with data uh, and data literacies. But most importantly, you're an unwilling expert in something I've never heard of called Coco Melon. What the hell is that? It's a torture device for parents of very, very young children. You can hear it on the background because someone demanded to have it um, started at 8 a.m. So, of course. Not oh, recommending it. Yeah, okay, it's... wow, that's shame. That condolences Jeez. in lockdown, Thank fighting you. off Coco Melon. Zach, go, oh. Zach. Uh, apparently, you keep applying for Leo's old jobs. Apparently, you're following him around the UK, applying for his jobs. Is that because he has a contact in the blueberry business? <laughs> yeah, yeah, mostly. No, this is how I really how I met Leo. Uh, uh, I've applied for a job. Uh, it was Leo's job. Then I applied for another job because first job wasn't good enough. That's why Leo left it. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, he was in the interview panel. And now he was the referee for my new job. So wow. there we go. And me, you are, you're, no, I think you are quite clearly. <laughs> so you're going to talk about uh, not stalking colleagues as well as navigating with open education policy maps. Uh, which sounds like a term you came up with on Dacha, but I don't mind. You guys talk and I'm going to vanish. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much for um, that lovely introduction and for um, having us here. Thanks, Gino, for inviting us. Um, it's, it's wonderful to join you. I will share this screen while I remember to do that. That's quite important. And I um, hope you can see, um, see our slides. Um, so yes, we're talking about navigating with open education policy maps. Um, and this is all about some work that we've been doing together for quite a long time. It's, we've, we've, been, we've been actually researching together for um, uh, sort of getting towards 10 years, I think. Um, and, um, and so uh, this is kind of the, one of the latest um, elements, but actually as time goes on, all the different elements sort of blend together and they're all interrelated. 
um, as as we will come kind of touch on as we as we go through, I think. So, um, so what do we mean about the policy maps? Uh, one of the things that we um, were, were doing in relation to this work of looking at open education policy was working with a project called the OER World Map. Um, and um, and we, can, we can share some, um, some links in the, um, in the chat um, to some of the things that we're gonna mention um, in case you're interested in looking them up. Um, and um, the OER World Map had um, acquired, it was a, it's a project based in, um, based in Germany, um, but looking at the really uh, what's happening in, in open education all over the world, trying to um, really build up a, a database, but kind of represented in the, in the style of a map um, of all the kind of different projects and initiatives. Um, and then um, also policies, and they inherited a kind of a batch of like, here's some policies that we know about um, from, um, from Creative Commons and, um, and added those to the map as well. And then we, we worked with the map on a project to develop a, a kind of a spin-off site um, called the Open Education Policy Hub. And the reason that we wanted to um, work with this project was to help in the process of kind of um, finding more um, more information to add to the to the to the map, um, especially about policies, um, but also because we were quite curious to um, to study the data about which which policies there are, um, and um, and figure out what different types of policies there are and that kind of thing, and. Um, and, the, and so what some of our work has been really uh, kind of building up a kind of a, a landscape review of what's happening with open education policy around the world. And we've kind of, we, we've, we've written up some elements of this and we have a blog post that we can share about that. Um, and of course, the knowing that what we are also very aware of is that knowing that different policies are out there and exist um, still doesn't tell you about what, what doesn't exist. And even knowing that policies have been made in places doesn't really tell you what's happening uh, in, in the place. So, um, so I, I quite like this phrase, the map is not the territory um, from uh, the philosopher Alfred Korzybski. This is one that I think people, um, people use this phrase quite often and it really speaks to me um, because it reminds us that um, that we might we might have a map um, that that represents certain things about um, about a landscape, about an environment, about a territory, um, and what you know what do we use maps maps for to try and um, to navigate from place to place to know know where we're going. Um, but maps are made by selecting the elements that are thought to be most important by the person making the map. So we also have to always think of the question of who made this map and what did they make it for? And do they actually see everything that's, that's, that's vital or that's important to someone else? Um, it's really a, um, an, an, a, 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 it's asking us to trust that this map contains everything, but, um, but what is the actual territory like? Um, and of course, if we're using a map that doesn't really represent the, the territory well, then um, we might end up getting lost and realizing that um, we, didn't, we didn't really understand where we were going and we have to turn back. And, um, and I think making policy about uh, a territory that's not well understood um, run, also runs this risk that we might think that, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great idea to make an open education policy, but we, we need to really think through, like, how is that going to work in practice? How, how do we really implement it? How do we resource the implementation of it? And so, so another part of our, our research um, is really considering the relationship between policies and practices and, um, and between uh, policies and practices and people, um, I guess, is the other the other P in that equation. equation. And, um, and one of the reasons that, um, or one of the things that we, that we did in, in writing a guide about co-creating policies, because we 
believe that um, that for policy to work, it really needs to be uh, a co-created um, product of of a, of a conversation amongst the all, all the people who are involved. Um, it, we thought we should come up with a definition of um, open education policy um, because there have been some some different um, different definitions advanced in um, a, a few different places, but nothing that we felt quite quite captured all the different elements. And so what we've come up with is that open education policies are written or unwritten guidelines, regulations and strategies, which seek to foster the development and implementation of open educational practices, including the creation and use of open educational resources. Um, so, and through such policies, governments, institutions and other organizations allocate resources and orchestrate activities in order to increase access to educational opportunity, as well as promote educational quality, efficiency and innovation. So here we wanted to highlight that sometimes a policy is enacted in what people do and in the way that they think about and the way that they work with certain, certain things um, and isn't necessarily a written document that you can find on the website. Um, and um, so we wanted to include the idea of the, the unwritten um, policies, although um, of course, these are, again, when you're doing kind of a landscape review, we're trying to map where the policies are and what they're doing. These are a bit, a bit harder to find out about. And, um, and we also wanted to highlight the importance of open educational practices as being really um, a, a wider um, concept than, um, than the idea that it's only about making OER. Um, and I think that these practices really are um, all kinds of ways in which uh, people act to op open up education, not only educational content, but those educational conversations, those ed educational experiences, um, even in including uh, the um, sharing amongst, um, amongst teachers about their practices um, and also, um, you know, students creating their own um, their own knowledge and sharing their own knowledge. Um, th this is not, um, so, so it was the, it, the, the idea was that these practices really are vital um, in themselves and also in, in the creation um, and um, an adaptation of OER. So what do we know uh, so far? Well, we thought in, in, um, in theory, this is how, um, we think that the open education policy um, infrastructure ought to be working, that we should have a, um, a really solid foundation um, from at the supranational level, and especially um, UNESCO has been a, a big um, influence and, a, and, a, and a, a leader in this, in recommending to member states all over the world um, to uh, kind of activate open education um, in their own in their own countries and of course the member states then at the at the national level um, as we have in the, the middle part of our pyramid um, should therefore understand you know how are we how are we going to implement this in our own context what what's what's needed in our um, here in our country and um, and ideally be, um, releasing the investment that's needed to make this kind of work happen. Um, and then at the top of the pyramid, and we're thinking particularly here about higher education, but um, of course there could also be, um, we could also be thinking there about school, school systems. Um, here, um, again, a, a, an even more localized implementation of open education policy um, should, be, should be happening, but with that support um, and with that uh, resourcing um, and hopefully that un unlocking of, of funding um, at the national level. Um, so this is how, you know, it's kind of, it is hoped that this, this can work. Um, but what we're seeing at the moment in, uh, around the world is that the open education policies are still relatively thin on the ground um, at the national and institutional levels. Um, Open education policies also, where, where they exist, um, tend to be um, quite focused on OER. And, um, and so 
we also think that while OER is, is very important, we think in order to be successful um, in de developing and um, making the making the, the best out of um, the investment that you might be putting into OER, we really need to think about the practices um, that will enable staff to, um, to to do that kind of work um, and to to um, to bring students into doing that kind of work as well. So, Javier, did you want to talk a bit about the types of policies that we have encountered in our journey across the landscape? Well, hi. Yeah, thanks, Leo. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, this is a, a bit of background in here. Many, many years, many years ago, uh, the JRC in, in, in the EU uh, invited um, us, a group of colleagues, to do our, a study on the state of um, open education around the 22 member states. Um, so one of the things that we did, it was to categorize poly, uh, open education policies. And um, interestingly, we could see that the ecosystem was quite fragmented. So we could find the classic dedicated open education policies, mostly is OER dedicated policies. So with a strong focus on the resource, not on the practice. Um, some commitments or policies derived from the national uh, uh, action plans on OGP. Uh, so countries that belong to the um, uh, Open Government Partnership have developed some national commitments and from those commitments, some policies have derived, um, ergo uh, Brazil. So Brazil is kind of the example of that. Some ICT policies that have a component of open education in within, so mostly school level uh, or university level strategies and policies about ICT education or digital education at that time was mostly calling ICT policy. So how to use e-learning and e-learning tools and they have a component of openness. Then we found another bunch of open education or OEP policies around um, open access and open science data policies. Mostly it's two or three lines in within an open access or an open science policy stating Oh, it, it is also good to foster or to promote open education or uh, to develop OERs through uh, open access or open data. What interestingly in this is that now the open science, so it's, I'm talking in, in a gap of like six or seven years since we published that study. <laughs> now the open science recommendations from UNESCO, it was basically kind of launched this week officially or um, it states the importance of having open education or catalyzing open education through open science, which is the first big supranational kind of recommendation that it's not on open education that talks about open education. This is, this is quite, quite unique. Um, the, the other ones, the other type of policies that we found is like generic um, education policies. Uh, so national or um, institutional uh, policies that are about education, they have a component of open education um, that can be from promoting open textbooks to promoting um, sharing content so, or opening, openly licensing content. And then we found some, this is kind of the smallest one, uh, the smallest group, and then I'll show you like the different uh, kind of the spread of, of diffusion of, of, of those policies around the landscape. It's policies that target the labor market. So how you can develop employability skills through open education, basically. This is quite a bit. And those normally come all from the US or from Germany. So this, this is kind of the, the types. Could be more, but this is what we could, we could find at that time and we're still finding. We haven't found anything outside this, this little flower. So as I was mentioning before, we looked at the distribution. We, we're looking at a data set of around 320 policies this day. Um, so from the work that we did from collecting um, the uh, policies for when we were cooperating or collaborating with the OER World Map, Lab, all the things that have come lately. 
So we have a data set around 220, uh, 320. Um, so we, we, we're looking into how it split the, um, the distribution of OER policies. So you have policies that come from priorities, so national or international or institutional priorities. And also you have policies that come from mandates. A mandate is basically a course of action. So where you're told that you have to do X, Y, and Z. That is a classic, a classic example of those sort of policy is open access. So if you want to progress in your career, you have to deposit um, your, pa your papers in open access or open access repositories. Otherwise you won't be counted for progressing for senior lectureship or professorship. That's a mandate. That's an obligation that you have to comply. So if your funders can put into the uh, grant uh, options, <coughs> sorry, into the grant, into the grant conditions um, that you have to publish in open access all the results of your research conducted with the money of the, such grant. So that's a mandate. Most of those policies are, or the most commons are open access. And the most or the least common are um, open science strategy and labor market, but normally those comes from mandates. So basically this is when it, the, the, the in, in, in the case of a labor market is when um, there are national strategic priorities about developing um, certain kind of employability skills. There is a mandate to produce resources to, for example, enhance the um, carers skills because there is lack of carers. So this is <clears throat> kind of the landscape on that side. And the most common that comes from strategic priorities are OER policies, and open textbooks policies, so mostly um, the North American market. But also, and this is popping up now, this is kind of the distinctive issue, is where openness has kind of basically permeated the um, digital education policy. There used to be a time where they were in running in parallel. So you have open education policies on one side and then digital education policies, but now they have permeated each other. So basically there's a lot of openness in within uh, digital education policies. And this is something that we've seen coming up when the institutions have to refurbish or renew or revise their policies post pandemic. So this is kind of the most common from, from strategic priorities. And then rising up as still not much, um, OGP uh, national action plans with an open education component. Although there is today and yesterday and tomorrow, we'll be running a UNESCO conference on open government and education policies. So maybe after this conference, we will see a rise in the next uh, national action plans. Leo? I would say just to add on the um, digital um, education policies point um, that there is a um, excellent new guide out from the National Forum for Learning and Teaching um, in Ireland. Um, on um, developing enabling policies for digital and open learning and teaching. Um, and I think that, that that's wonderfully um, captured how, um, how digital is such a key enabler of openness and, um, and how these, um, these um, ideas are best thought about together rather than um, siloed. Um, and that's been also a theme um, for us over the years as well. When we were um, writing about open data a few years ago when we were talking about how the open data movement tends to um, be in its own silo and the open education movement is, is, is kind of talking amongst itself and, um, and without enough uh, kind of um, cross um, cutting conversation to, um, to think about um, what can these movements do for each other. And so I think that that's been something that we're gratified to see, for example, with the um, open, UNESCO Open Science um, recommendation that, um, that this, is, this is now evolving um, significantly. Let me just get to the next slide. Okay, uh, so in, in here, if this is, this is the, the thing when you meet someone that you, you put people that is working with data, and start doing policies, we basically use the, the policy data set uh, and do, we do graphs and, 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 and try to calculate things. So basically this is how it's distributed um, across um, the world and the different types of policies. 
Um, but I, it is kind of to give you an overview of how the landscape is. And when, when Lee was saying that the territory means different things, there is a distribution of policies that match their own cultural context. So maybe maybe Leo wants to specify this, but th this is kind of, we can see the distribution across across the world. Um, well, we can we can certainly see that the um, in different in different parts of the world um, the the trend in the policies is that there is that there is a different uh, emphasis. And for example, in the North American policies, um, the there is a, a, a quite a close um, focus um, not just on OER but really on, on the open textbooks um, specifically and. Um, and then um, I, I think we have found that in Latin America, there tends to be more attention to open practices, um, including resources than in other regions. So I think that, you know, it's, it's quite interesting to see the, um, the, the geographical distribution of different conceptions of openness really. So, um, so this is just uh, thinking about the um, the elements, the elements of policy, not in terms of what you must have, but how to how to start uh, bringing the elements into into a policy. Um, obviously, for um, open content, there needs to be um, a, an awareness of um, of copyright and licensing, um, and a kind of thinking through of how does this um, how does this relate to your, your other policies and your kind of legal responsibilities? And, um, and this also relates to uh, policy coherence, although that's addressing also a wider question of, of, um, of all your other um, uh, policies, including open science and access. Um, maybe there are open government policies and commitments um, in your country. And really uh, working, working with um, the, the other policies that are out there rather than and seeing how um, how they can contribute to your um, open education work. And it's also important to think about open education as, um, as something that really can enable um, teaching and learning um, innovation. Um, and um, not only by not only by giving access to um, content, which is of course is, is vital, but also by creating communities of open practice. These are some of the um, of the policy elements that um, that we um, that we have found in, in 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 many policies, but not necessarily um, not necessarily frequently that we find all of them, and um, and that we recommend really um, thinking through if you're working on um, developing or redeveloping a policy. And this is written about in our guidelines for uh, co-creation. Uh, so. We think it's important to consider um, how you're going to build capacity um, about um, accreditation of, of learning. Um, so that could include, for example, where people are going to um, build up um, credit towards a qualification over, over time without committing to the whole thing in the first place. Um, thinking about inclusive learning design, including, um, of course, accessibility. Thinking about the resourcing and the, the funding that's going to um, make OER and OEP um, possible. Um, thinking about um, di diversity in terms of the access to knowledge, not only to, not, not only to um, having access to content, but access to create knowledge and create content. Um, and overall thinking about how you can foster a culture of openness um, through your organization that um, really naturalizes um, OEP um, as, a, as a way of working rather than as, a, um, as an afterthought. And uh, Javier, I don't know if you wanted to talk about um, about this side, this relates to some some 
in, in a way an, another strand of our work that we're now seeing the significance in um, open education policy as well. Yeah, uh, of course, this is kind of a post-pandemic reflection. One, one of the things that we've, we've been noticing, again, it's that in the digital education ecosystem where open education is being kind of embraced, there, there is a, a new element that the deployment of digital learning and in some cases surveillance um, tools for education and uh, algorithmic and, and the data analysis <clears throat> and also the uses of artificial intelligence in, 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 in education. Th there is an element that maybe is not yet well considered in um, OE policies that has to be with the social technical, ethical social technical elements um, about the platform governance for um, open education. So when we create a platform for open education from, I, I mean, any, anything, it means um, um, uh, MOOC okay. uh, tools, OER repositories, um, data or, or open open data repositories or any or even an OER that it's been um, AI powered in, in, in some cases because um, artificial intelligence can develop OER and, and, and it's happening now uh, and there is some interesting projects about it in, in Ljubljana um, in, in the Center for Artificial in the uh, Center for Artificial Intelligence in Education that there is happening so there, there needs to be some regulations about data protection um, data governance how a learning analytics on the use of such OERs will be will, will be handled because if if you are uh, powering or enabling learning through a learning analytics um, there needs to be certain regulations about how you're going to tr attract performance and what's going to be the right of privacy for you for, for the students and for the academics or for the um, educators in general they're using such platforms so when we're designing um, open education and digital education policies that will in, imply using digital education tools, open or not, there needs to be a strong data governance framework. And in the case of open education, if the resource is AI powered or artificial intelligence will use to um, kind of choose the learning opportunities or to map the students, or if the students data on performance or how they'll be using the resources is going to be used to further develop resources, there needs to be a governance plan. Because we, and, and this is something that we keep repeating, not because it's open, it means that it's ethical and good by default. If it's going to be open, needs to be ethical and good, but can be, should be, that, that will be preferable, but may, 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 may not. So we need to think how our data is going to be used, how we're going to govern the platforms and the open education platforms that uh, we're developing or we are adopting. So if we're bringing an open education platform into our uh, institution, for example, open textbooks, do we want that this platform monitors how they're reading, eye tracking, uh, click tracking if the students are because we, we don't know, even though the platform is open and their resources are openly licensed, that doesn't mean that they're not using the data as the kind of exchange currency for such openness. So this is something that we, we'll, we need to start considering in, in, in this field. I think we might be running out of time. Um, so, I, I will just say that um, we we um, hope that you will have a look at um, our um, policy co-creation guidelines um, where um, we've made some um, suggestions for how you can develop a process um, around um, building your own local um, open education policy. Um, thank you very much for listening to us. We'll share the slides. We've got um, a lot of... Uh, links and, um, and, and things to follow up in there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I loved you guys. Give them a round of applause. They were fantastic. Thank you, uh, Dr. Javera. Thank you, Leo. We loved you guys. That was so informative. 
And we're going to ask you to just stay on the call because I want Gino to come. We're going to rush to our break. Clap in that comment section, you lazy bastards. I love them. Even Comrade Blueberry nailing it there. Uh, so go to that comment section. Uh, we're going to deal with some of your questions. So put your, con your questions in the comment section and Gino's going to come facilitate it because apparently he knows what he's talking about in spite of the fact that he's wearing a toweling that he bought at Pick and Pay. Take it away, Gino! Okay, I, I'm not going to respond to this. Um, I'm like, we thank you so much, firstly, to all of the present pre presenters. Um, this was absolutely inspiring, motivating, and also challenging. So I'm I'm going to take five minutes and actually just facilitate this this Q and A. So I'll I'll pose the question, and if the um, relevant presenter could just put their videos on. Um, I, I think like you could all just do that for this moment. Um, and then we'll have a 10 minute comfort break and be back. During the comfort break, I will also play a short video from Anya Polanya, who's um, from the Open Education for a Better World um, program in Slovenia. So the first question was from uh, Matilda Smith and, and Wayne. This was actually for you. Uh, Matilda says, as a mature person who grew up with the wireless, which is the radio, and a rotary phone, um, people, do you know this? Um, or as a young African child with data and connectivity issues, being digitally literate can be traumatic. So I think Matilda's question is like, what hand-holding support, Wayne, can be provided with the methods that you were speaking about? Uh, it's, an, it's an excellent question, but also a challenging question at the same time. Um, to live successfully in a digital world requires that we live and work digitally. It's kind of like learning to swim, right? Uh, it's, it's a skill we need to learn, but you can't do it without getting your feet wet. And despite the immense challenges, I, I think we have an obligation if we are serious about providing our youth with the skills they need to survive in the future, uh, we are going to need to support, uh, you know, digital skills development. And the best way to do that is to learn by doing. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, we have the tools available, and particularly if we are using free and open source software technologies. Uh, there uh, aren't the challenges of cost in terms of access to the tools. Uh, connectivity will always be a challenge, but... Um, we really need to focus on, on building the skills uh, for our youth in navigating digital futures, because without it, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be hard for them. Yeah. Thank you. I see that um, some of the other presenters are nodding um, quite uh, <laughs> emphatically here. Um, thank you, Wayne. I, the next question, uh, well, Igor Lesko actually asked a question uh, to Prof. Foxcroft, and um, Prof. Foxcroft did answer, but I think it would be good to put this into the video record. So the question to you, Prof. Foxcroft, um, considering the challenges that students faced, as described in your presentation, Igor says he's curious to know what your plans are to transform teaching and learning practices at our university uh, using open education. Thank you so much, Gina and Iga. I've just put my video off to make the bandwidth work a bit better. Um, so yeah, I think there are lots of things that can be done. The one that I suggested in the chat was that we have processes to put new programs and new um, modules in place. And there's usually forms that have to be completed. Now our forms already ask of academics to say what OERs they're gonna use. But, but that's almost secondary to the traditional textbooks. So one thing to do is to actually go and review that form and to reverse that so that the first question is actually about what open resources are you going to be using and maybe even developing because often programs take two, three years to be approved. So you've got time to actually develop a resource. So that was the one thought. And then the other thought was around the fact that um, there are projects many universities I think are engaging in this now to develop open textbooks and it just for for example for South Africa if we could actually pool those efforts as we heard from some of the input from Wayne and Prof McCoo as well 
the, the more we can pool efforts, create a national repository, the more we can get some of that traction going that Prof. Maku said around changing mindsets of academics. Because if they have to go and look hard for something, it's likely that they're going to say it's too much effort. But if there's a national repository, and then I think what I took from the last um, presentation now is we'd have to have a good governance structure for that repository. And, um, and last point, Iga also pointed out that, in fact, it could be for higher and basic education that we have a repository. And we could also see how our students could actually get engaged in developing some of the materials for basic education. So there we go. That's a couple of thoughts. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. That's a that's wonderful um, response. Um, I see that Matilda had some other questions. And Igor, I would actually ask if you would be um, willing to just respond to Matilda's questions about do we have a repository of open education resources, repositories, um, sort of a macro list of macro lists. Um, it would be wonderful. And it's also then available for everybody to be able to go out and explore that. Um, Prof. Makwe, for you, and this one comes from Igor also. He says that as far as he recalls, and I do know this as well, UNISA has an institutional OER policy and strategy. I know Kerry DeHart was instrumental in that, and uh, we were also involved somewhere along the line. It's been in place for some time now. So considering this from your experience, how has the policy helped to accelerate and entrench OER or open education within the institutional culture and practices? Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, Igor, for that question. Um, we were one of the few, the first few, who started with the, with the OER uh, strategy. But I think I want to, to acknowledge um, that there, there hasn't been much, um, but there, there has been elements of, of excellence around the university. But Leo pointed out something, I actually wrote it down uh, in his presentation. It says, making a policy that is not understood, it runs the risk of not going anywhere. And, and, that's, and that's where the problem is. The problem is, yes, some of us who understand what open education is all about, we get excited and we come up with policies and all these things and people, it doesn't go anywhere. The, the second thing is that as much as online learning has been around for 30 years, it, had, it was not embraced as it had to be during COVID. And even when it's embraced during COVID, it is not the right kind of online learning. It's just a, the emergency type of online learning. And I'm very worried that will go on with the emergency and forget what, what needs to be done properly in order for it to be of quality. Thank you. you oh, you turn off. My apologies. Thank you, Prof. Markwe. Leo, I think that it would be um, a good thing like if you could just speak to that same thing quickly and then we'll go to the comfort break afterwards. Uh, which was the thing? Sorry, Gina. Oh, sorry. I'm um, just about um, like how to make policies more accessible across, you know, because like very often we have these amazing policies that, that speak about so much, but the language is just such a challenge. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I think that there, there isn't a sort of a magic solution to it because um, sometimes you do want to discuss um complicated things in a, in a policy or, or you know, uh, but you should really, if you're using terms that everybody doesn't know, um, or you're talking about kind of educational practices that everybody isn't used to practicing, then I think it's probably really important to include definitions because um, as, as we know, even in the um, open education movement, um, every few years, there's a new, somebody else has a new definition of OER. Um, there, there is a, you know, there, there, people, people produce a lot of definitions and that it isn't necessarily um, that one of them is correct and everyone else is wrong. I think it's important just to be clear about, you know, this is how we're using it. This is what we mean by it. So I think include, include an explanation of what your, you know, what your terms mean in your policy. Um, but also, even, even more vitally than that, 
co-create the policy so that everybody who's going to kind of use the policy and be governed by that policy actually has a voice in, um, in, in what goes into it. Thank you, Leo. And I see that Javier has basically said the same thing, that um, promoting co-creation is so important so that stakeholders participate and co own and therefore everyone learns about it and i think that in south africa especially um as we speak about fees must fall and decolonization and development that we put students also into the creation of policy because they will be governed by this in the education system and on that note i'm going to hand over back to chester uh, we'll take a short uh, comfort break for 10 minutes and in that comfort break i'll also play a short video Chester, over oh, yeah. to you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See you again in five minutes. See, ten minutes, but make it five. Like a five ten. Like a South African three. I'll see you now. Bye. Bye. Play your bloody video. Where's the video? I can't feel the video. Is it coming now? It's working out our play presses. Hello, play. everyone. I'm Anja Polajnar from Ljubljana, Slovenia. And I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present I mean, my experience really in the field of open. I have always been passionate about activities supporting creativity, development, cooperation, growth, openness. And therefore, I'm glad that Professor Daniel Bancic and Mitya Ermol invited me to be engaged in a project that represents all the values I personally and professionally believe in. This project is called Open Education for a Better World. It's an international mentoring program that was developed and is managed by University of Nova Gorica and UNESCO Chair on Open Technologies for Open Education Resources and Open Learning at Josef Stefan Institute. To shortly present the program, it supports the development of freely accessible resources for open education on topics with social impact according to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The program provides an innovative approach to building open educational resources by matching developers of educational materials with experts volunteering as mentors. The program was implemented in four subsequent years. In the first year, 14 developers from all over the globe joined the program. 35 developers joined in the second year. In the third year, 80 developers joined. And in the fourth year, more than 100 developers from all over the world applied to the program. Due to increased number of participants and time differences, we invited hub coordinators to help us manage the program. And here I would like to thank all the mentors and hub coordinators who work on a voluntary basis, showing in the best possible way what they believe is important. These are just some of the projects developing scope of the program, addressing challenges of the modern world according to the Sustainable Development Goals. Some of them have reached really large audiences and have had strong social impact. The projects are then publicly presented in scope of the EduScope event, which is organized in person, Vipava, or virtually, but in any case, the energy at these events is always full of inspiration. In continuation, you will see some of the highlights from the events. The program is all about development. On one side, a project leader develops an OER with assistance of a mentor. And on the other side, the OER with its openness, adaptability, reusability, contributes to knowledge sharing and therefore to development of society as a whole. 
Being open, collaborative, enthusiastic, transparent. This is all about moving things forward. It's about sharing without limits for good quality and inclusive education for all. Here I would like to thank my co-workers, especially Anna Fabian, team of videolectures.net and team of Media Interactive. I would like to take this opportunity to invite you all to join us at the fifth call for participation for developers, mentors, hub coordinators. See all the information at this website. And I would like to thank you for the opportunity and I'm wishing you inspirational Open Education Colloquium.
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm feeling the love. I'm feeling. I'm feeling the love. I'm feeling the love. Open education. Open education. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. I hope you're all doing great. I had a nice break. I hope you got to poo or whatever you did. Fed your kids. Had a back rub. I don't know what it is. Uh, we've got to move swiftly along because I'm very excited about this next speaker. Uh, Prof. Mitchell Jamal is uh, he's f dialing in all the way from Slovenia. Uh, Prof, uh, is your mic and camera on? Please turn it on. We want to introduce you speedily. Yeah, can you see me now? Yeah, I can see you. You've <laughs> also got massive earphones. You must have got them in New Zealand. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm okay. I'm just jumping from one meeting to another. That's yeah. life. I know. That's the world we're living in. Uh, Zoom for days. Uh, you are in, and, and correct my saying, Ljubljana. Is that how you say it? That's Ljubljana, yeah. Ljubljana. Ljubljana. Okay, sorry. Sorry. I don't, I don't want to mess it up. No worries. Talking, <laughs> no, no, my apologies. My apologies. You're transforming education with the help of AI is what you're going to be talking to us about. Uh, if, can, you, can we be sure you haven't just sent an AI to attend this meeting? Like you. Yes, that's true. Technically, I'm old school AI. I'm like analog AI. You got jokes. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, um, in South Africa, we have another word for AI. Uh, you may not know this. Yeah. They're called politicians. Thank you. Yet again. Burn. Burn. His name's Ace Machashule. Google him. Uh, but it's great to be talking to you, Prof. Uh, take it away. We're very excited to hear. I'm very excited myself to hear about this. I'm going to vanish and let you do your talking with just your ears there. I love how all professors just show us their noses when they do virtual meetings. Just my nose <laughs> there. I don't know how cameras work. I've just found out. It's my first virtual meeting. Bye, Prof. I love you. <laughs> Clap for Prof in the comment section, you lazy bastards. All right, people. Uh, so I, I hope that you see my slides now. It's a, it, is it? Is it online? Can you see me and hear me? Yes. All right. So uh, thank you again for inviting me to this event. Uh, so here I have a set of slides and the story I actually get bored already because I'm repeating this all the time. Uh, so I would like to change a little bit so i will show you what 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 is the main message and what we are doing here but then i would like like to show you things that are actually now live so the things that we developed and we are running and one of the things that actually has been discussed before and the question was about the global repository for oer so i will show you where we are today with this uh, x5 bomb pipeline and uh, how this goes on but essentially uh, so uh, who am I? Uh, so, uh, Mitya Yermol, um, I have several hats here at the National Research Institute um, in, in Ljubljana. Um, so, we are doing research on artificial intelligence for years now. It's a pretty large group of roughly around, uh, it's, that has to be updated, roughly around 100 people. And uh, so this is one head I have. The other head I have is that I'm UNESCO chair on open, open technologies for open education resources and open learning. And then I have also the third and the fourth head, which makes my life very, very complicated. So the, the second one is that I'm leading also the department for knowledge transfer, which actually takes care about putting things into practice, which then brings in the the, uh, the, the business agenda into my life. And then the fourth one, which is new from last year, is actually uh, I'm the part of the management team of International Research Center on AI under auspices of the UNESCO. So um, here, uh, this is what we do. I'm just briefly showing you this thing at the, for the uh, uh, International, International Research Center on Artificial Intelligence, because I think this is something which goes very much in line of uh, what we do in open education as well. So here we are doing, um, so of course it's AI, it's about uh, artificial intelligence. And here what we do in the, you see the first box is to research about AI, but not really about technology because this is what we do already. 
it's about the consequences of technology. So what, what are the consequences in terms of ethics, in terms of new organizational models, in terms of changing minds? So you know, all the social aspects, economical and social aspects as well. The other part, which is also very, very important is um, deployment of the technology. So we've did so far more than 100 projects on applying AI in different sorts of domains. So from, uh, from smart cities to automotive driving, energy grids, uh, medicine, pharmaceutics. So a lot of things that we did. Uh, but here, um, what we wanna do is actually really uh, create large scale address uh, global issues related to SDGs with AI. And for that, of course, we cannot do that alone. This is why we are building the AI network. So the network of AI competencies across the globe, because this is international, of course, that means that it's international networks. And uh, so we are pretty much very, very good at it as well. So right now we, we have um, more than, uh, more than 70 governments uh, joining. So that would mean that uh, they are representatives of all these governments being involved. And of course, uh, it, when we do that, uh, we uh, also want to make um, this AI, um, uh, we, we want to take a talk, talk about AI, which is not a black box, uh, which will you know, take over the humanity, but something which will actually help. And this goes into awareness raising and education. So a lot of things that we do, development from statistical machine learning to semantics. So this is, you know, all each of this line is a set of technologies on AI that can actually help address some of the issues which are related to open education as well. I will just briefly go through. So some of the elements that we have been involved in, some of the topics. And uh, so the fact was that when we, when we joined this movement of uh, open education, and that was, uh, essentially, by uh, by starting the uh, process of uh, OER recommendation or UNESCO OER recommendation, we actually did, uh, saw that there is you know we, we had a lot of technologies developed for you know all these things so complex systems, telecommunications, network, pharmaceuticals, medical. Uh, very little was there for education. So. Uh, our approach was that we really want to, if we step into that, we want to make a change. And that would mean changing this mechanistic system that we are running today. So what we do today with the educational system is that we are, we are actually um, um, optimizing the system and we are not helping the user. And uh, this should be changed. And this is why you want to do something completely different, which is creating or using all these resources which are available right now, putting these all these resources into uh, uh, to serve the individual, not to not to be vice versa, but to actually serve the individual. So that would mean a kind of an adaptive social environment for learning. So and when we started to work with it, we said that let's let's see how we want to do that. So if you really want to make some transformation in education, then you do, should do that holistically, which would mean with the proper tools, um, which would be this lower layer, so global, open, transparent, effective infrastructure with all these tools and everything that AI can bring in. On the top, of course, the uh, national and international policies that can open the doors to make changes. And then, of course, these verticals, which would be series of projects. And uh, so we strategically started with, with you, not us, so with all of us. We started uh, several of these ones. So um, that one has been presented just the video before. So when Anya was talking about the global mentoring program uh, on open education for a better world, and also the leadership of open education master program, where we actually right now running the second year and we really are selecting uh, we are really are uh, uh, selecting students that are having ability to change things in their countries. So uh, this is how the status is. Um, what I wanted to show today a bit more is about uh, how we are dealing with the AI and what we are building up. So here is a kind of a, an idea, a basic idea that we started years ago. So having tools that would be able to automatically ingest clean fusion structure, all these open educational materials, but not just open education materials, also other open infrastructures, which would be, you know, either open schools or open labs or whatever, 
into something which would be a coherent library. And then on the other end, of course, to create tools that would help individual to get, and it's individual, it's not just a learner, but also teacher, of course, to get proper materials in one click. So not to browse around and find out and be completely scattered and, and lost in the in the in the, um, uh, in the world of of uh, of this information and misinformation as well. And then when you combine those two things, then certainly what we can do with AI is actually automatically create or semi-automatically create a career path. So not just a learning path, but career path, which would be a little bit longer than just uh, a short uh, a short education or program. And when you have that, of course, then you can create this adaptive uh, learning environment. And here, I've, what I'm showing to you are uh, bits and pieces that we are now putting together. So those are software services already running. And now we are making a complete, uh, uh, complete horizontal uh, integrated. So um, how we are doing that? So this is just briefly of just the idea. So how would the world look like in education if each of us would have access to all these different billions of different uh, uh, elements of education, which would not only be content, not only be services, but also teachers, also environments, virtual laboratories, libraries, uh, concepts, scientific papers. So this, a lot of things are there which are completely impossible to grasp. So none of us can actually read, read 750,000 articles that are being published every day. It's, it's completely impossible. Now, what AI can do, of course, is certainly help in that respect. And this is just one element. So if you just go to and to see, for example, what's happening on the, on the apps uh, for education, you know, again, there are billions. So what, which one to choose? Uh, where to start? Um, it's complete, you know, it's complete mess. Then open education resources. I mean, now we, this is, this should be a data. So we are approaching now probably to 2.5 billion of OER elements, which are scattered around the globe. And it's really completely impossible to get uh, all of them to understand what is there and actually, actually to choose the right ones. And, uh, you know, with all these elements, which various isolated sites, different modalities that links and describe modes of use different levels of quality, then all those different languages, language diversities, and all these things are there that are actually creating this complexity large, uh, bigger and bigger. And then, and then if you put the process on the top of it, which doesn't really just mean to understand or to have the, uh, the idea what content is there, what information, what method to choose, but also what are the motivations, what are the guidelines, goals of a particular individual, then to support monitoring and assessment, the complexity grows again. And if you want to really change, make things open, then you have to open everything. So from infrastructure, content, method services, programs, set value models, polities. And you know, in most cases, we know all of us, we know that you know this is very hard. So very hard to get even to, to governments together to start thinking about collaborating on, on, on joint open educational initiatives is already a problem. What about the complete, complete, complete globe with all these diversities in, in mindsets and, and ideas? So uh, these things are complex. And you know, it's not just about those things, it's about a lot of other open elements as well. So open approach, open value-added models, initiatives, motivations, and all this stuff. So how would you manage this such a complexity? And here, here the AI came in. So because AI actually is something that helps understand uh, the complex environments. It's not that AI is very good at understanding and interpreting because AI is still stupid, but it's very good to show you things, you know, in a way that people can grasp. And that would be a complex a, a view over the complex system with billions and billions of information and then offer you a ability to actually go deep into uh, stuff which is important. And here, and here, of course, if you look at this triangle, which is learner information, content, teacher, and machine, what we are doing today is content structure and information understanding, user modeling and assessment, 
and then of course intelligent assistance as well so those are the things which which are in the development some of them are already in practice and um, i really want to show you uh, this thing now so this is what we we started to develop three years ago so the um, the completely automatic uh, ai system to collect uh, digest structure automatically translate uh, open educational resources. We did a bit of uh, um, um, uh, experiments on the resource quality processing. So how or whether AI is potentially uh, uh, capable of, of uh, determining what is the quality of the resources that actually came in in this stage number, uh, stage one and stage two. And then we, just have a basic talks about what the didactic, um, what the didactic uh, processing uh, and pedagogical processing should look like. So here, as I said, the two first steps are pretty much, you know, something which is a technical work, and those are the two next one are more like a search work. So, and um, what I wanted to show you, um, I will just get out from from slides now, and I wanted to show you. Um, how this looks like a bit in life. Um, uh, uh, let me go to mm, mm. so um, so let me show you how this looks like life. So here uh, you will see now um, how we are collecting all this information. Um, and what would that mean in real life? So this is now real life collecting information. And, you know, it's really impossible to really, you know, even stop and look at what is going on. So this is how the information comes in and this is how we have right now information already provided. So this is now a, uh, a, a global library of OER that is uh, freely accessible. Here still I'm showing you the work in progress. So here we have uh, many elements. So I just uh, put in the, you know, the OER, related to policies. Do we have anything on policies? And now you will see um, how many elements are there. So now everything that you see here is automatically processed, semantically enriched, uh, translated in 16 languages and um, a bit of quality, quality assessment uh, so that we put things which are more important on the top and things which are not that important on the law. But, you know, it's here only for policies there, you know, we have many of this, uh, of this uh, OER content elements. So uh, this is, this is uh, how, how things looks like uh, live now. And uh, the question of course is um, how we can, I will now go back to, uh, to slides, uh, how we can, uh, how we can make these things usable, right? And here you have several elements, several services that we develop, which is a recommendation engine, so that you actually can use this engine to, to enrich your service, your internal service, with recommendation of the similar elements from the library. So. Essentially, that will mean if you have an OER repository running, then you can actually apply this uh, kind of a snippet, which will then relate on what users are looking at your end, showing you what are all the relevant materials which are being collected from all over the world. So a kind of a integrated mechanism is how you can actually connect all these uh, um, all these um, various OER libraries together. Then, of course, is analytic part is discovery part, discovery which goes deep down into semantic level, not just about the link level. So semantic level, we mean down into the content. So that's essentially you can just check the part of the text or the part of the video describing a particular topic. Uh, translation, so that you can translate um, those things into, uh, uh, into your language. Uh, connection and the feed. So those are services that has been developed already are available and they're attached to this library that I've shown you. 
Now, uh, we do a lot of things on user modeling, as I told you. So the most important thing is that what we, what we find out is that actually at the end of the day, uh, you have, uh, it's not really necessary to, to get to the user individual level. Because at the end of the day, you only have, you only have like 20 different types of material of learning material use. And this is not that we, this is what we actually learned from, from, from collecting all this information about the use. And then we did all the categorization and everything. And we find out at the end of the day that this first line here that I'm showing. So this is actually the groups that are necessary and enough to do personalization. You don't need to go to the personal level. It's enough that you can, you, that we find out what type of the learner uh, is actually approaching. And then we will just categorize into all of those and then personalization can be done. So this uh, is something which I think is very important and it goes into the direction of uh, solving a bit of the, um, uh, of the uh, um, uh, questions that we are usually getting on privacy and security. Uh, this user modeling, of course, uh, it then can be used for different things, like you know, even understanding what is the skills distribution. We are using all this information as well to support um, to support the work that uh, are the UNESCO or uh, European Commission. Uh, UN, even the uh, African Union are doing on uh, competency standards. So here we are trying to match all these competency standards together and then use the information that we're learning from the real world into refining all these elements as well. Um, uh, here, then we are using this information to, you know, to do the compact, uh, competency models calculations. So um, here you can see how this looks like uh, if you look at the each particular individual in the context of the social network. Here it's a competency network. And then, of course, uh, when we do the competency modeling and using micro credentials, then we can create the learning paths that can be, you know, very short time so that this should be just a course or maybe a longer time which would be a bigger thing so um, um i will just skip this one and um those are things i think are now the challenges so the challenges that can be addressed around so um ai it's just a tool right so it's not something that would be uh, uh approached differently so ai is a tool that humans can use and AI can help. Now, but since AI is a different source of tool that actually are showing us a kind of a mirror of how humanity works or how individual works, then it triggers many things like ethical challenges. And just yesterday, the, the, um, the recommendation on ethics in AI has been adopted by UNESCO education process challenges so uh, challenges that are actually interfering with the current educational processes we know the old mindset that we have in the educational system that kids have to you know uh, sit in the school and listen and be quiet this doesn't really work anymore if you look at your kids at home they are learning completely differently then educational system challenges so you know certainly this actually interfere with existing educational system and then, of course, with the mindset, right? So if you talk and you go out in the in the in the in the wild and talk to teachers about AI, you know they are all scared. So because you know nobody actually explained what this is and how this looks like and what can how AI can help. More or less, all the information that we are getting is that AI is actually a threat to 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 us. And then global education of prospects as well. So, and what we humans are trying to do, how do we're trying to address them? So first of framing it through formal policies and frameworks. So the ones I just said, uh, adopted yesterday. Then we're trying to find proper operation, organization and business models. This is still in the kind of a trying to figure out how this should look like. But then we have all the other part, which is this resistance and ludism, which, which we know we, we work with the AI for now for, for 25 years. So we know what is there and what AI is capable of doing, what is not capable of doing. So, uh, and this should be reflected in this kind of awareness raising educational models as well. 
Now, <clears throat> what is happening? Of course, as I said, so um, UNESCO recommendation ethics and AI, this is one thing which is important. Then EU has its own ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. Then Council of, Council of Europe, which is the international organization, not just Europe, but international organization of countries, established a that whole committee on artificial intelligence where they try to, uh, we, are, we are involved in all of those more or less because through the UNESCO center. So uh, trying to address the, uh, uh, trying to set up the system that will be able to certify the AI. So before something being developed, put into practice should be certified and should be for the global good. So this is what, what uh, Council of is doing. Then you have OECD is very active in OEC AI principles. So this was actually the first document that addressed uh, all these broad principles related to AI. Then you have global partnership on AI. So uh, there is a working group on responsible AI. Thinking about that, it's a, it's a kind of a, a little bit slow, but you know they are still you know discussing about it. A World Economic Forum, they have their own ethics, ethics framework. Uh, then there you have, they have a new asset of principles for artificial intelligence. And then you have no numerous national artificial intelligence strategies and human rights um, uh, documents. And of course, even the eternal company ethical principles. So um, we are really addressing this issue. So humanity is addressing these issues, but the problem is not really about the technology. The problem is that we have to agree upon. I mean, if you really want to do something which would be a kind of an open, different sorts of, uh, let's say, open, transparent um, uh, education, then we need to agree about that. So, and it's not just about us, which, you know, which we are preaching that, but it's about, it's about government, it's about policymakers, it's about uh, people globally understanding that, that, that uh, education is a global good, not something that have to be maintained in a country and that this would make a country better because at the end of the day we are breathing the same the same air and drinking the same water so things that are not really important on the level of technologies we i think that in most cases we right now humanity is looking at ai as a something that would be a could be a kind of a goat right I would go, so the, the guilty one and it's not that, right? So the AI is actually working as we are teaching it. And it's not AI problem, it's humanity problem. And in particular, this also relates to education because when you talk to people now discussing about AI and education, in particular in Europe, it's about all these threats coming out. How would AI replace teachers? It will not, it will not. AI is a complement, it's not a supplement. At the end of the day, the show, the education show should be done by somebody who is a human and understands all the elements of human beings, which would actually include the social aspects, group dynamics and all these things. So um, uh, the two other things that we do, and Anya was already invited you, so uh, we are now in the five, fifth round of Open Education for a Better World, and uh, the Masters in Leadership in Open Education. So if you think that you would be interested in to get into this, this international, uh, uh, international program on leadership in open education, where we really want to create something which is a community of leaders in open education that can then be a kind of a group uh, pushing things forward, then of course you are more and more than invited to, to join the program. Uh, here are some of the links that I usually put. Um, so everything that I've shown to you, everything that I'm, uh, I'm talking to you. So I'm the UNESCO chair on open technology. So all these technologies are open. Uh, some, not all of them are open source, but open accessible, but most of them are also open source. So feel free to get, to see, to express, to come back to me telling me that this is a complete rubbish or bullshit or whatever, but certainly we want to push things further on from the stages we are right now, which is having technologies ready, running, but uh, still be, to be used uh, globally across the world. 
So uh, all, thank you very much for listening to me. So I don't know if the questions are now or later. The questions are later. The questions are later. Prof, you've been great. We love you. We love your big earphones. You're doing genius work. Give a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Give a round of applause to Prof Jamal. Thanks, Prof. Um, so uh, we, we're going to move very swiftly along. Uh, stay on the call because we have a question session at the end of this. I'm very excited to ask you about uh, AI and if you can find me an AI girlfriend. But uh, before we do that... <laughs> I would like to ask you, you can turn your mic off and your camera off, Prof. We're going to get you back up in a few minutes for questions. We'd like to uh, post your questions for the Prof in the comments section while they're fresh in your head. I'd like to ask Molia uh, Vandermina to uh, turn on your, your camera. Volia, turn your, Molia, turn on your camera. Turn it on. There we go. Turn it on. Hello, Volia. Molia, how are you? <laughs> Hello. I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm fantastic. Fantastic. I'm feeling great. I'm feeling full of beans. Uh, listen, you're in Joburg. Yes, I am. Do you have water and electricity? Yes, we do. I'm surprised well done. we have water. No, I, I, water <laughs> I know, they're running out of water like day zero in Cape Town. Cape Town got so bad, people were delaying getting pregnant because they're scared that when their water breaks, <laughs> someone will use it to flush. You have no idea, Molia. Uh, listen, oh. they told me that you love to dance, but you're not very good at dancing. Is that true? It's so true. I can't dance oh, I'm sorry. to save my life. Oh, that's terrible. You should get into government because in South Africa, that's where we send people who are bad at something but still like to do it. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to hear what you have to say. Quality or equity in developing uh, education. That's such an important topic for South Africa. So my friends in the comment section go absolutely crazy and give it up for my friend Molia. Thank you, Molia. Bye. So I'll just turn off my camera to save the bandwidth, if that's okay. Okay. It's so, okay. Thank you. Um, Molly, so just I'm, a note, you are in presenter mode and we can see your notes on the side. Oh. Full screen. We still see the notes. I think it's okay though if you just share your presentation. Go for it. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so my name is Molly Vindamina as uh, Chester ever so um, eloquently expressed and introduced me. I'm a writing respondent and I'm also, um, I'm also an open education influencer at the Academic Literacies Writing Program under the pro my project manager, Gino Franzman. So um, today I'm going to be talking about transformation. I'm going to be talking about equity or equality in developing education. I think you can just click present a view. It's okay, Molly. <laughs> Sorry, Gina. <laughs> um, so several transformation oriented initiatives have been undertaken to affect institutional changes in universities across South Africa. Essentially, these initiatives have been aimed at achieving equality and non-discrimination in higher education. The basic definition of transformation is that it is a marked change in form, nature, or appearance. In terms of education, this, is, this has a deeper meaning. The, person, the, the purpose of transformative education is to empower learners to see the social world differently and through an ethical lens so that they will challenge and uh, change the status quo as agents of change. Equality is simply the state of being equal, especially in status, rights, and opportunities. But there are two types of equality, formal equality and substantive equality. Formal equality assumes that everyone is in an equal position, and as a result, everyone is treated in the exact same way. Substantive equality requires that, that positive actions are taken to address past injustices, such as racial segregation and inequality, gender discrimination, and other systematic forms of discrimination. 
Unfortunately, um, mere equality where everyone is treated in the exact same way is not enough to sufficiently develop, decolonize and disrupt the education that is currently provided because it doesn't consider the disadvantages of the past and the current situations that continually put people at a disadvantage aren't considered as well. With the current status of things, this equality in higher education is of little to no impact and it actually perpetuates the the vicious cycles that people currently live in. On the other hand, equity is just and fair inclusion. It requires that each person has different circum each person has different circumstances and allocates the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach a fair outcome. Um, South Africa therefore subscribes to the concept of substantive equality, and this is backed by the Constitution, Section 9 of the Constitution, which um, encourages substantive equality or affirmative action measures. This means that the practice of treating all students equally can be said to fail to fall short of the equality principles contained in the Constitution. The principles in the equality clause attempt to remove barriers preventing some groups from social, professional, and political participation. This highlights the importance of substantive equality or equity despite the constitution not explicitly stating it because it aims to remedy the injustices of the past. In terms of education, remedying our past includes the advancement and promotion of open education. Therefore, we can say that the constitution encourages equity in order to eventually achieve equality. Unfortunately, in trying to treat all students equally, the actual student experience is often overlooked and students are often held to the same standard and expectation by academics, lecturers, instructors, and even administrative staff. Prof, uh, Professor Foxcroft, Foxcroft and Dr. McIntosh highlighted these challenges so beautifully. So I'll just run through them quickly. Um, I would like to point to the high tuition fees where most, most South African students can't afford, afford these fees. And this is worse for refugees and asylum seekers who are regarded as international students and are charged two or three times the amount paid by South African nationals in these institutions. This is unfair for people who literally left their home countries with the clothes that they had on. Transportation to and from campus is also a significant problem that needs to be brought to the forefront. Before COVID-19, lecturers and instructors often expressed anger or refused to allow students into lectures if they were late. But this is an example of the failure to understand the general cost of transportation, as well as the challenges of using shuttles. Usually students stand in long queues, even in bad weather, because the available shuttles don't often meet the demands of the students that rely on them. Um, another issue I'd like to point to is the language barriers. Um, English is the, the main language that is used in most universities, but how amazing would it be if we had resources available in South African languages, such as Tosa, uh, Zulu, Ndebele, and African languages such as Swahili or French to cater for the refugee and migrant community. It's also important to take into account the anxiety resulting from some or all of the above challenges that have been mentioned previously, because anxiety can make it difficult for a person to function and can affect a person's mental health and wellness. In the case of those working to support their studies, exhaustion is also a factor. In my research findings, which was, uh, seek which was seeking to examine unfair discrimination against female asylum seekers, I found that asylum seekers and refugees who, are, who were able to attend university worked several jobs to support themselves. But this isn't unique to the refugee community, but it applies all around, especially for the previously disadvantaged disadvantaged communities. When it comes to students, we need to uh, follow a holistic approach that not only focuses on increasing the numbers of previous disadvantaged students in our universities, but explores other structural factors that may hinder access to education, such as cost, cultural inclusion um, into the social fabric of universities and social cohesion 
curriculum change to decolonize education and make it more Africanized, if I can use that term, and to change the face of the faculties and departments in some of our institutions of higher learning. All of these factors need to be examined from a human rights based approach and need to be emphasized as components of open education. As a result of the challenges um, that students face, um, a lot of students fail to cope with the university environment, the culture and the responsibilities, which leads to frustration and ultimately results in high dropout rates. Uh, Prof, uh, Foxcroft provided us with these statistics and they were really shocking. And these factors are interlinked and dropping out is often understood as a series of circumstances rather than an isolated event. So we just always need to take into account all the factors that are going on in the students' lives. Um, the sustainable development goals are the main topic across different disciplines, fields, and platforms. SDG four is about quality education and the full title is ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. So much emphasis in, is placed on education because it facilitates individual development because it is the key to integration. It enhances a person's prospects of securing employment and economic independence, which in turn ensures access to food, housing, and healthcare services. Quality education um, is linked to other SDGs because education results, results in decent work and economic growth, which leads to poverty eradication and zero hunger, which promotes good health and well being, and so on. The links um, between the SDGs are endless. It's important to always remember that education is both a human right in itself and an indispensable means of realizing other human rights. As an empowerment right, education is the primary vehicle by which economic and by which economic economically and socially marginalized adults and children can lift themselves out of poverty and obtain the means to participate fully in their communities. Hence, education is critical in both freeing and unlocking the potential of each person. But because of the practical challenges, open education is the vehicle for change. Open education resources, they provide a strategic opportunity to improve the quality of learning and knowledge sharing, as well as to improve policy dialogue, knowledge sharing and capacity building globally. As educators, we shouldn't only think of open as OER, like open textbooks and materials, but we need to ensure that we facilitate access to education by applying a holistic approach, which considers our teaching practices, um, different student circumstances and context, and allocates the exact resources and opportunities needed for them to reach an equal outcome. We can't solve all the problems at once, but we need to start from somewhere. Changing our practices is a fantastic start in advancing equality and equitable open education. In conclusion, treating um, students equally causes many students from previously disadvantaged social groups, specifically students of color, asylum seekers and refugees to incur perpetuated disadvantages because their contextual backgrounds are often overlooked. It's important to examine the background of every individual student, but it's important to note that common contexts of students, particularly those from the disadvantaged groups, um, can help us to come up with an overall um, uh, curriculum that will help them. While equality is the ultimate goal, the process of eventually achieving this goal requires equity and fairness in practice. We need to make sure that we develop the kind of teaching and learning interfaces that enables agency, a sense of coming not only to know, but to, to own the knowledge and be empowered by it. We need to make sure that our teaching philosophies always acknowledge and connect with learners' personal, emotional, ex personal and emotional experience, rather than neglecting the learning potential that lies in these experiences. We need to engage these experiences through 
dialogue, which is social interaction that integrates different perspectives, including affective knowledge, such as emotion and experiential knowledge. It is important to always remember that dialogue is different from discussion because discussion can tend to put aside the effective and experiential. All of these efforts need to take place with a commitment to continually creating a more equitable and ethical society and requires invention to imagine the ways that communication and collaboration happen across cultural and political boundaries. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity and for your attention. That was great. Thank you, Volia. You, uh, I keep calling you Volia. See, I'm colonizing you. Sorry. Give it up for Molia. She was wonderful. Molia Vandamina. Woo! 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 Yeah, we loved it. That was fantastic. We're going to move along very swiftly. That was delightful. Let her know in the comment section. Hang around, uh, Molia. We're going to ask you some questions at the end of this. Such an important conversation in the South African context, isn't it? My goodness. Hey, South African universities are so colonized. There's even a university called Wits. They thought it should have thought about that name. It's Afrikaans for white, if you don't know that. Uh, people from overseas. So um, I'd like to, we're going to have a panel discussion. We're going to ask Gino Franzmann to come back. Apparently he's still employed after all the shenanigans. Gino, turn your mic and camera on. We're also going to have, we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Chrissy Neranzi. Dr. Chrissy, are you on the call? Turn it on, calling in from Glossop in the UK. Turn hello. it on there. Hello, hello, Dr. Chrissy. How's it going? Just call me Chrissy, please. <laughs> I like calling you Dr. Chrissy. We've got a guy here called Dr. Kamalo. He's not a doctor at all. So for us, it's a first name. It's great to see you. I like your jersey. It's very nice. It's a woolen jumper. It's wonderful. <laughs> That's why we call it the UK. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, and then we, we've got to get uh, Dr. Verena uh, Roberts. Dr. Uh, Roberts, are you on the call, Dr. Roberts? I am on the call. I am Mont here. You're, you're in Montreal. I am, and I'm half asleep. <laughs> oh, shame. I know you woke up at like two in the morning, so you could be here. Thank you for doing it. We love Canada. Uh, we've seen Justin Trudeau. It's so young. It looks like Harry Potter's running Canada. Uh, Dr. Paula Corti couldn't make it because she's got an emergency where she lives there in Milan. And I'm going to oh, hand over I'm immediately. Well. Are you on the call, Paula? Yeah, yeah, I am, but I have to run out. I don't know if you can hear the emergency. <laughs> I can. Wow, you sound like you are in well, South I mean, Africa I during looting. On my smartphone. Okay, that's great. This is going to be rock and roll. I thought you were in the first world, but apparently that term is racist. So thank you for being here, Dr. Corti. Uh, in Afrikaans, we would call you Shorty. That's our court is short. It also you, Dr. Shorty. It's great to have you here, Dr. Corti, all the way from Monza in Italy. So guys, take it away, Gino. Do your discussion things. Bye. Thank you, Chester. So I'd just like to say welcome uh, to two like special friends, well, three of them, um, Chrissy, Verena, and Paula. Um, we've been together through lockdown and, and engaging in an international collaboration of, of such epic proportions. And um, Chrissy, I'm going to let you take the lead. I have a couple of other presentations. So over to you. Welcome, my friends. And I'm so proud of all the work we've done. So go for it. Thank you so much, Gina, for this kind invitation and the collaboration. Um, are we sharing our slides? Because our impression was that it would be... Oh, there's Paula. <laughs> Ciao, Paula. Ciao, Paula. <laughs> our impression was that we are going to Ciao, use some everyone. slides yeah. to, talk, to talk through uh, our project. Is that still okay, Gino? Or do you want us to free flow about the collaboration? Okay, I'll upload then. One second, share the screen. Thank you. Let's do as we have done before. Right. Can you see that? We can. Right. This means I can't see the, um, the chat, but I hope uh, colleagues and friends here will, will post and uh, let us know what's happening there. So a very warm welcome to our session. We are here to to share an exciting project we have been working on for over six months now. I think it's, uh, oh God, it's a year ago. <laughs> we started it a year ago, I think. <laughs> and uh, it has led to some uh, exciting outputs as well. So we are sharing here the picture book together. 
and what that could mean for collaborative learning across uh, boundaries. Uh, and with me today is Paula, Verena uh, and Gino. Um, the whole uh, project was about creating a picture book uh, to tell a story about open education and introduce a wider audience to open education beyond higher education. Because I think for me personally, that's is a limiting factor of open education. We seem to restrict uh, the relevance of open education to higher education. So with that picture book and so sharing a story, telling a story uh, and retelling stories that we all know in a, in a unique and very different way, um, we are contributing towards SDG 4 for quality of education, like it was mentioned by others. Um, already. So this is our very international um, and diverse uh, group. And uh, I'll let Paula, um, briefly, Verena and Gina introduce themselves. Paula. Stop walking, woman. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, sorry. I have, you are in front of Politecnico in the oh. meanwhile, and it's raining. <laughs> it's an emergency. Yeah, it's a test, probably, but uh, I'm here. So <laughs> if you can progress to the next slide. Okay, just briefly, Verena, say hello. Hello, Verena. Robert's coming in from Montreal. Hello. And we all know Gino, Gino. then, yes? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, Paula. So um, what we started to do at the very beginning of uh, um, our project was to share a survey with the uh, open education uh, advocates, practitioners, teachers, students, etc., to collect uh, their feedback about uh, their view about animals. We wanted to use animals in our story. So we ask them which animals are uh, considered open by you and which are their antagonists. So <laughs> we would like to briefly ask the same question to you. Do you have any idea about it? Which are the animals that you would like to, and write it in the chat, that uh, come to your mind when you think about open and which are the animals that uh, come to your mind when you think about the antagonist to openness? If you want to write it, well, you're welcome to. <laughs> and uh, well, what happened uh, uh, to us is that we received uh, many responses and uh, many animals, uh, something like uh, 27 were identified as open and uh, 16 as uh, their antagonists. But uh, in the picture here, what you see actually are all the animals that were listed in both. Okay, so our choice uh, was to choose animals that are represented at the same time in the mind of uh, some of uh, the advocates openness and in the mind of some others, their antagonists. Also because uh, they are just animals as we are just humans. Yes, and exactly. And that's quite powerful, uh, Paula, I think for us as well, isn't it? Because we often have prejudice against or exactly. bias. So that really um, was a valuable lesson for us as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, the, the next uh, thing that we asked uh, is, uh, was about uh, vulnerabilities and strength of open educators. And uh, we asked uh, for... Uh, um, uh, adjectives and the qualities and um, what you see in these slides are the list of uh, um, uh, of what people told us okay and in red you see that we have uh, as vulnerabilities uh, curious generous bold and as a strength bold curious and generous again and uh, we addressed those uh, we prioritize those, okay, because we wanted them, <laughs> again, to represent both vulnerabilities and strength at the same time. So in, in this slide, which is quite rich, we also had a lot of reasons why people wanted to address uh, uh, um, those, those characteristics of openness and of their strength and vulnerabilities at the same time. And uh, you see that uh, the list is longer than uh, 
the the short the shortened one that we presented but here you can see that uh, the red lines again appeared in both lists so one thing we struggled with um, when we started writing because we did write the story together collaboratively and we had two teams so the first sub team um, put the seeds in uh, of the story uh, taking inspiration from our own experiences but also from what we found in that survey so the story is evidence based, uh, if you like, and evidence informed. Uh, but we struggled to come up with a, with a storyline to represent um, metaphorically open education that would make it accessible to a wider audience, like we said, because um, our, our audience was beyond higher education primarily, but we do know that picture books are cross-generational. So our, our colleague and friend and collaborator, Penny Bentley, who is not here today, but from Australia, reminded us um, of um, how the metaphor of river has been used by, by Siemens here, as you can see, and we grabbed uh, that idea and run with it. So already you see that we are reusing, recycling um, ideas in our uh, own story. And this is the way we work together. Verena, would you like to briefly, just some of the highlights? Um, it's really important to understand that our methodological process was a synchronous process that really uh, do was dominated by Twitter, I would say. So <laughs> we would connect and and engage with, with each other and even organize when we were meeting, uh, which teams uh, we were on. So we split up into two teams um, because of our geographical factors around the world. It was really hard to meet all together. So while I say we were synchronously meeting, um, we would connect and speak and interact in Twitter, but we would meet um, as teams to work on different sections of the picture book and then give each other feedback on the picture book with, uh, as well. Um, at the same time, we had Chrissy working on the doodling component and expanding on the images and uh, dealing with challenges in that in particular um, and illustrations and designing. Um, she was also mentored by an incredible uh, mentor, Brian Mathers, who came in to help and support her and really expand on her uh, uh, cartooning and illustration experiences. You'll see on the side that we did meet um, numerous times synchronously. And I just want to add that this, as I say this, this is very methodological and research-based, but the support that we gave each other in this time, um, it was very trauma-informed in that this happened during the pandemic. And this was a great opportunity for us to all meet and connect with each other um, in a a research infused way, but really um, helped engage us in open educational practices and uh, change the world in our own little way and give you, and as I said, give each other support. And finally, at the end, you'll see that we did do some peer reviewing and translating and you know, and his team, I can say, are, are leaders in taking our final version and translating it in multiple different languages um, to share across South Africa and around the world. Yeah, it was fascinating seeing the project coming together because for me it was a GoGN fellowship which I shared um, with the team and it became a collaborative undertaking but uh, a high risk also because we started from a blank canvas basically uh, but thanks to collegiality here we all and camaraderie uh, we all stood together and um, created some some wonderful outputs uh, and we are still working on it <laughs> yes we are yeah so um, throughout the process, uh, because Christy was doing this as a fellowship as well, she encouraged us to um, think about our reflective practice and we wrote blogs. And these blogs, um, we wrote many blogs actually, and they were led by different people within the team. But what was highlighted in these blogs was what was working, what were our challenges and what we were learning from the project. And even looking at these pictures, I'm not quite sure who took these pictures, but I do laugh because we're all laughing in these pictures. And throughout um, this experience, there were many many tears and many, many laughters. And you'll see, so some of the things that worked were the, the collegiality that, that Chrissy spoke to, the fact that there was constant peer review and that we had to, um, I think what was really important and we all spoke about was 
the the way in which we communicated with each other, the respect that we had for each other, and the underlying understanding that we needed to figure out how we could best communicate with each other um, effectively um, and kindly. Um, and I see also in the learning points, we pointed out kindness was important, appreciation, reciprocity. Um, and I do find it interesting that we all stayed with the project throughout the whole, the whole project. Often you lose people in open educational uh, projects for a variety of reasons uh, because we're volunteers often in many cases but this one became very important and I think again I'll bring up the pandemic it was it was going on in the background there were different time zones um, the way we spoke to each other could be different and taken from different angles and perspectives due to um, uh, who we are and our perspectives but uh, overall uh, I think Chrissy's leadership uh, Gino's here humor and Paola's and everyone else's and really contributed to the camaraderie and educational learning that did evolve. That's really great and I love these pictures here at the yeah. bottom. These are stills <laughs> that I took you know from our live sessions because I just oh. love seeing you laughing you know and smiling and having a good time. So on the left you see on the left bottom hand side you see a, a very first doodle uh, of one of the scenes and on the right hand side the the finished scene and so what happened is basically and we already said we we did recycle ideas we based our ideas on existing ideas we took them um george siemens metaphor like we said of the river uh, run with this but also injected other stories and on the left hand side you see some of the inspiration from different cultures here um on the right hand side i think what we do need to mention is the um, uh, not so much the story but the illustration side and we were inspired by OE Global Conference that took place uh, in 2018 uh, in Delft and um, An 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 Anemis Bruckgarden was there and did a keynote from the Rijksmuseum and we found out the fascinating work the museum and important work the museum is doing to share all the exhibits under the Creative Commons license uh, to use for any, any purposes even commercial ones and we we took that idea and explored the opportunity uh, within our picture book to use some of um, the details uh, in some of the exhibits, the, the exhibits from that museum in, uh, in our illustration. So you see on the left hand side here, um, the exhibits that we did use and on the right hand side, uh, the, the scene where you see all of them. So Potentially you could take a screenshot perhaps and see where is what, um, but all seven exhibits, uh, details of these exhibits are um, represented in, uh, in the visualization, which uh, was done uh, by Odi Frank uh, and myself. And I found out very late that Paula would also want to be engaged, but hopefully next time. <laughs> Gino. Yes, thank you, Chrissy. So um, just some quick sort of snapshot statistics about uh, the actual book. So the book is called Together and the story has 154 words. There are 15 illustrations. And like Chrissy said, um, the illustrations also sort of uh, incorporate images from the Rijks Museum. In South Africa, uh, we have a university, I mean, um, a museum, that I'm investigating now so that we can actually make it an Africanized um, rendition of these illustrations. We have blog posts, uh, which are five of them. There's a fellowship report that Chrissy and uh, us, all of us collaborated on for the Global Open Graduate Educational Resources Network, or GOGN, um, because Chrissy was, was amazing enough to have one, a fellowship which helped to support this project's um, realizations. So at the time when this was done, there were 20 translations uh, in various languages. Um, I'd like to call out Malia and the Open Ed Influences also because they were instrumental in getting several of the South African languages. So we have four South African languages. Uh, translations versions available now. And then we've got Swahili, we've got Russian, we've got French, German, Italian. Um, it, it's really like such a mammoth task. And, and I just want to say thank you for everyone, but also to send a shout out to anyone who's here 
if you are interested in making a, a, a translation or a version of the book, reach out to us. We want you to, to be part of this amazing journey. Next slide, please. So um, Chrissy spoke about the Doodle fans, um, um, sort of, which, which is a platform online that, that any of us can access. Um, you can also access the Doodle fan um, sort of platform in order to generate your own version and your own translanguaged version of the book. Um, it's important to also realize we don't just want one language at a time. It's, it's, it would be lovely if it could be English and Zulu, for example, if it could be French and Swahili. This is a book speaking about open education and the value of collaboration and sharing. And I think that that's embodied in this team. So please, Look at the chat, um, the Doodle fan link is there. You are able to go there and start making your own version of this now. Over to you, Chrissy. That's fantastic. I mean, um, Gino, you are leading on this, but I'm very happy to, <laughs> to talk to you. So uh, Gino just introduced the Doodle fan tool and how you can expand and extend and create new opportunities to engage with the story or parts of the story and plot your own uh, story. Um, Gino, um, Molia and Verena have actually created an audiobook that won an award very recently as well. And we are very grateful if we can share also that link, uh, if it's easy to find. Um, and I have. it's just a wonderful example. And I know that at the moment there is another audio book. There are two more audiobooks uh, in preparation, one in German and one uh, in Greek that will be done by school children even. So we are really looking forward to this, but also like uh, Gino said, you know, it would be lovely to see other um, individuals from around the globe um, being involved in, in some of the materials we have made available, obviously under a Creative Commons license. So um, yes, we have one more award, <laughs> we global uh, as a team for the book, and uh, we are humbled that the, the wider global community has recognized our collective efforts, and we do need to recognize um, the contributions that this community in itself, the open education community around the world, um, has been a, a big contributing factor and a valuable support network in making this happen. And Gino, as we know, also won... Um, the latest award here, uh, the Emerging Leader Award. So our warmest congratulations to you, Gino, as well for this. Gino. Thank you. Okay, so this is the open invitation. We'd like to create new versions of the book in different languages and, like I said, bilingual. Um, we want to remix artwork. So, again, it's not like we're trying to do something from the Global North, which speaks about the Global South. We are speaking globally, so we want to, we want to embody collaboration, but also cross-network sort of efforts and inputs so that it doesn't just speak to one group or one demographic. It speaks about all of us to all of us. So we want you to create an audio version. Um, and then I think like just Verena, if you'd like to speak about your current work with the book, maybe. Just wanted to mention that um, as an adjunct professor with the University of Calgary, Workland School of Education, I am working with pre-service teachers. So teachers that are learning how to be teachers or students learning how to be teachers. In our course on issues in teaching and learning, uh, they are asked to create a digital story and it's about themselves and their own teaching identity and how they connect to community, which really relates a lot to the topics in this conference um, in itself because we discuss equity, we discuss uh, inclusion and diversity and how that connects to them as teachers for the future. And what we did was uh, I introduced the book um, and I brought it into class and I showed them how we collaborated around the world to, to create this uh, PowerPoint. And I literally showed them how we created the Zoom um, audio version, Gino, and how easy it was. And and while I might think it is easy, it is not that easy for others. So it's really important to explain the process of how we went about doing this step by step. I introduced them to Doodle fans so they could see what a template looked like. Uh, we looked at storyboarding. You'll see all these integrated in our project itself. Um, but it, 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 it inspired these future teachers to go out and now they will not only 
be able to use our example in their classes, um, but they're able to adapt it and share it with students and hopefully encourage those students to do something like it in the future as well. So thank you very much, Tino. That's lovely to hear. And uh, we do encourage um, colleagues who work uh, in the school sector as well, like we said, and we would love to get uh, in touch and see what uh, what initiatives you, you are undertaking to, um, to engage with the book and the values of, of open education. So um, you can find us on Twitter um, using the GoGN uh, PB picture book. Uh, hashtag if you like and I, I will I will close our contribution by referring back to something that uh, Professor McCoy said earlier and she said students need to see themselves uh, in the curriculum uh, using story means that this can happen naturally because we are born uh, storytellers we grow up through stories we tell each other stories in our conversations and our everyday uh, activities so it's how we can utilize the power uh, of story to to spread the values of open education across the sector so that uh, individuals uh, young uh, and perhaps more mature can find and see these mirrors and the opportunities the windows uh, in these stories and connect with them thank you very much Hala, la, thank you. Give it up for all of them. They, that's amazing. A collaborative story written around the world. Wow, yes. Woo, yes, yes. I'm feeling the love. I'm feeling the love. I'm feeling very excited. I'm feeling a jumper from the UK. That's a, a jumper, jumper, jumper. And an Italian running around from a fire. I've never seen that in my life before. Definitely the first time I've ever said, run, there's a fire. Oh, and on a Zoom call. Um, I, fine, guys, I might die. Uh, that was great. So you guys can, uh, to, we're going we're gonna to jump the question and answer session. We're going to go straight to our next panel. We've got all mentor uh, and, and whole team, uh, Andrew Tuo uh, and uh, Neil Wiley. Can you guys, and Gino, you can stay, turn on your cameras there. Hello, Earl, how are you doing? Turn your mic on, guy. Trista, I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for I love having it. me. You and I, I, I am having you. You and I have the same haircut. I love it. We should put our heads yeah. together. It'll look like a bump. I love it. Love it. I saw that Barack Obama once told you that you are sunshine mixed with a little hurricane. Yes, that's correct, yes. That's also a weather report in Cape Town today. There'll be sunshine mixed with a little bit of hurricane. <laughs> and in Kabecha, to be honest, that's why it's Kabecha, because your head gets blown back as you say, Kabecha, and it's just the wind in summer strand. Okay, Andrew Tuo, Andrew, are you on the call? Where are you, Andrew Tuo? Turn on your mic and camera. Neil Wiley, where are you guys? Is it just Gino and Earl today? Okay, Gino, right, I'm going right to move. Right there. Oh, there you are. Thank you, Andrew. Nice to see you. How's it? Very well, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Uh, he's a, a, a Kenyan in Kabecha. My goodness, you have lost your way. But it's get, That's good my to have you here. Handle. That's my That's new, handle. A, Kenyan, a Kenyan in Kabecha, yes. Except white people will not be able to find a Kenyan in You've just colonized my tongue. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Take it away, Gino. These guys are going to have a discussion on something very important and uh, my piece of paper just vanished now they're going to be talking about peace building and high-risk communities in south africa uh which in south high-risk community in south africa is called twitter bye <laughs> thank you chester and just as a quick introduction <laughs> oh Earl, going to take the lead here because Earl's actually a project leader in the open education for a better world World Program, which is a UNESCO program uh, underneath uh, Prof. Mitya Germo, who was on earlier. Uh, the Open Ed Influences are also part of this project, and Andrew has been part of the project in 2021 as the learning developer who's helped us to, to translate Earl's vision into an online environment. So Earl's course is now fully available on the engage.mandela.ac.za website. Ooh, it's a free and open online empowerment course. And I am super proud of all, as you can see there, myself and Neil are Earl's uh, mentors in the OE4BW uh, project. And Earl has done a stellar job. And Earl, over to you. Super proud. Thank you so much, Gino. 
for that beautiful introduction. And good afternoon. Um, I feel privileged to for this opportunity to present our Peace Building Open Online course. And I'll just get into it. Um, many people residing within these cement hostels we call council flats within high-risk communities describe the world as a world of darkness. I personally feel that the people here are facing the worst of times and the lack of harmony in these locations without a doubt penetrates the lives of our young generation. So just witnessing the hate and despair of all, um, despair all around us um, makes us and makes my online peace building course even more relevant. So the Cape Flats, what is the Cape Flats? What is a high risk community? And why do I believe my online course will play a fundamental role in helping custodians for positive change be more bolder in their outputs when facilitating conflict in previously disadvantaged communities in our country. So how can my course make a difference? Helping communities manage conflict and diversity will need an immense amount of effort. So hence we believe that creating peace building ambassadors through our online peace building course will help shift the way we do things to bring about positive change within communities beset by negative social ills. So who is this course for? My, my, online, my online course presented here today intends to assist students in delivering peace building content inside the classroom and communities they serve. And which might help learners contextualize peace building knowledge in real life situations. So therefore assisting students in having a sense of social responsibility and cultural awareness at an early stage in their professional lives. And I'm excited to, to really share with you the opportunity I've had with my mentors and those that, that have played an integral role in, in contributing to making this online course a reality. So thank you to the uh, becoming an influencer, the influencers from the Nelson Mandela University and my mentors for, for really adding a powerful dynamic um, to my, my online course. And here we, we share the, the easy steps, five easy steps to access our course online. As you know, have mentioned. And yeah, with with the support and guidance I have received, um, I'm deeply appreciated. And this is just an example of the certificate of completion for my course and the beautiful faces of my mentors. And I'll give it over to Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. My sharing you. All right. It's going to get my screens right. I think we're good. Let me stop. Hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I understand we're uh, running a bit behind schedule and we're, we're chasing the load shedding as well. So I'm going to see what I can do before I get shut down. Uh, my name is um, Andrew Thur. I'm a learning technologist uh, here at Nelson Mandela University. Um, this is my, my cluster. That's my department. That's the LXD cluster. That's where I sit. And my cluster, we have about four, 14 members, and I'll just introduce them just a little bit later on. 
And on our side, um, we're part of the Digital Learning Experience Design and Innovation uh, cluster, mouthful. But we have uh, an acronym that's LXD for short. <clears throat> on our side, we have a wonderful studio. So some of the graphics, I wonder if we put the right way, is it this way? Some of the graphics that we have and some of the designs that we, we have in our unit or across our institution, um, delivered by one of our colleagues here. That's part of our LXD studio, but it's not just design, it's also um, uh, the learning paths, uh, deployment of technologies across the institution. We have our innovation hub, and uh, some of my colleagues were here earlier, but uh, I think we had to dash to another meeting. Uh, but in that space, we look at uh, AR, AI, learning analytics. It's a big space, and uh, my space here, I'm going to get my little cursor out if I can. My space here, um, I'm in the technology training and support hub, so I assist staff and students with uh, the online learning teaching platforms in terms of training, in terms of resources. We're part of an ecosystem, so we have at least one learning technologist in every faculty across the institution, and hopefully get one in George campus next year. So this is my team. Um, it's Mike Koshala. Um, it's me and my colleague uh, uh, Elmin, also known as El Money, because she's she's just passionate, she's just brilliant at the work that she does. Um, Koshala is actually the one who introduced me to Gina in the context of this project, and Mike also my line manager, very supportive in all that we do. If I could give a meme for our energy as a, as, a, as a team, both in terms of the LXD class and the peace building unit. It's, it's definitely Max Goodwin from uh, New Amsterdam, and it's, it's the energy of how can I help you? Um, there's so many gaps for, for learning, for education. If there's something that we can do to assist you, we are very keen, we try our best, to, and this is what we keep in mind. Whenever we get an email, a Teams message, a letter from ICT, it's how can I help you? So this is the team that we're working with, uh, Gino, Neil, uh, you there, and that's Earl. And I was introduced to the team a little bit after the project had began, um, but they made it so easy to see into the space. Uh, and I'm going to chat about little. I'm going to chat a little bit about the tools that we needed to make this happen. Uh, my approach, of course, from the technical side. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we just had to get a couple of digital tools in order for us to do this correctly. So the first thing we had to do is set up a, a whiteboard or a Jamboard space. We have this in the Google Jamboards, and we just uh, looked at some of the ideas that we needed to make this happen. So we looked at H5P, some of the resources that we have available in the institution, and some of the platforms that we had to use to make this happen. But all, all in all, we had to look at the resources that we could offer and what we could do to bring this project to life. So despite the tools, I think uh, the people are just the most important pieces of the puzzle to make this happen. Um, at the end of the day, we decided to go with the Engage platform. Um, Earl just mentioned this. Um, the course is live, and we should be having participants on as soon as possible. And we're using this uh, platform. Excuse me, I'm trying to get my cursor out of the way. There we go. Um, and this is the Engage platform. So that's a platform that we use across the institution. It's a Moodle instance, but it allows us to have participants who are not credentialed in the institution. So you can pop into that site using your Gmail account, which is just the easiest account to work through. And we set the first thing, sorry, the first thing we had to set up on the site is just a training, a brief training site. That's a training site there for, for the four of us to understand what we need to do and how it would possibly look. Um, we, all, we all don't need to be learning technologists in the same space. We all have our different strengths. But on my side, I thought it was important for us to understand what the Moodle the Engage or Moodle platform was like. You don't need to learn how to make a cake from scratch. Just if I give you bake mix, you'll, you'll know what to do with the rest. And that's what we were trying to go for for that product. So that is our peace building uh, course. Um, it looks a little bit different. This uh, video is slightly older. We are constantly updating the platform. So even if you go into the site, probably next week, there'll be new content. I went to the site this morning and I found new content from, from Earl. So we, we're constantly updating the platform. Um, it's very dynamic um, and it, it's, it's something that you should look forward to. Um, I'm constantly learning in this space as well because I come from a different economics and development studies technology background. So getting into a course like this where you speak about topics like racial equality, anti-racism, stuff that I never get to engage with in terms of my academics, uh, it was fantastic. Um, it's gonna move across. The only tool that we really had to fork out for was the RISE or the Articulate tool. Uh, this is a web-based platform that allows us to get some of our resources. Um, these are the resources that Earl generously provided us with. 
and embed them into the Moodle platform. As you can see, it's very easy to navigate across platforms. If you have participants who are going to join or do this module on their phones, they can do that there as well. Um, it's really user-friendly, nice and easy for participants to use. We considered embedding some of our quizzes into this platform, but just as like I said before, it's pretty dynamic in terms of our questions and our content. So we had to, I think, use engage for more, uh, yes, engage for more of those tools. So this is just a brief uh, snippet onto the platform, so what it looks like. Um, it possibly will change again very soon. Um, in terms of our communication, we were mostly on Teams. Um, it was just, I think we were all familiar with the platform as well. Uh, something that uh, we didn't keep in mind though was that there are some barriers in terms of access and credentials to Microsoft Teams platform. So it would have been much easier, I think, if we had used um, Google Hangout, Google, Google Hangouts. Google Meets, I think that'd be the proper term. Um, I think uh, that'll be the only drawback I have in the space. This uh, screenshot is our Trello screenshot, and that is, I believe, our saving grace. I think at the end of the day, just having a platform where we could all uh, put our information and share our notes, how far we are, map, map our progress, and share this. And there are so many participants in this project. I had no idea until I saw this fellow that um, I think there are just initials that you can see on this page that are everywhere. But that was just really what helped us pull the course together. Um, in terms of our successes and our hurdles, I think it was pretty challenging trying to understand the different backgrounds, the context of how you want to bring this module together and rely on other people, other participants' strengths. And I think we're still going through it, but I think uh, just working with, with each other and um, just getting a lot of support, the attitude and uh, the frame of mind that we went through this program. We're on a WhatsApp group. I'm still hoping we're going to have our little go away trip as a unit, um, but it's just a very healthy culture. So we're able to jump over some of those hurdles in terms of the, 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 the challenges that we had to address in this space. And we had a lot of support from the institution um, to get this going and uh, very grateful to be part of this project. And uh, I have been Andrew Kuo, the Quebec Kenyan. Uh, I forgot it already. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you. It's lovely to see like all the work that we've done and, and how like so many of these platforms have helped us to do it. Um, so we are in a pandemic. We are still here. And unfortunately, COVID has touched our team. And Neil is unable to be here as he's dealing with some of um, the implications of that touch. So we wish Neil and his family all the best. And instead of Neil being here, what we do have um, as a, well, as a way to share the work that has been done for, by everyone in the team, um, we have a video. So this was a video that we prepared for the Open Education for uh, a Better World um, pro um, project launch earlier this year, as well as for OE Global. So what I'll do is I'll play this and you can see and hear uh, from all of us at once. Hi, my name is Neil Wiley and I'm an e-learning developer in open online blended learning at TU Delft in the Netherlands. My job sees me support a range of online and blended courses from many disciplines around the university. I get to meet diverse and interesting people and advise on aspects of course design and pedagogy to ensure the course and supporting success. I was approached to support Earl's peacekeeping uh, courses and mentor and absolutely jumped at the opportunity. I did a bit of research on Earl himself, and he's, he's such an engaging person that it's hard not to be kind of taken by his enthusiasm. It's also such a worthwhile endeavor, and seeing Earl's enthusiasm again and passion has really inspired me. So I've enjoyed our collaboration on this project to date, and always look forward to having banter with the South Africans whenever we meet. Um, after we struggled to understand each other's accents, things tended to go quite smoothly there. And uh, I even have Earl speaking a bit of Irish, which I'm sure will dazzle with you at some point. I want to continue to provide advice and mentorship on this course. I'm confident that it will be a great asset to the open education community, and I feel I'm um, very privileged to be involved. Hello, my name is Gino Fransman. I'm from Sijil, uh, a small village in Kleberga, which is in South Africa, the city formerly known as Port Elizabeth. I work at Nelson Mandela University as an academic developer 
and I'm also the project leader of the Open Education Influencers or hashtag Open Ed Influencers. I'm a mentor and a member of the advisory board now in 2021 and I completed my own OE for BW project which is an online course called Becoming an Open Education Influencer. I grew up, I come from Ocean View in Cape Town. This is where I originally know Earl from. I know him from school and I feel incredibly privileged to be able to support him and his project. It's 20 years later. We course reached Earl and once he completed it, we supported him to apply for OE4BW uh, in 2021 cohort. So here we are with a fully actualized and a prolific social and community developer, Mr. Owen Mentor. Always looking to share opportunities with no restrictions or copyright barriers. So open education is a perfect vehicle to help him share his gifts with others. Listen as Earl shares his gift and explore how you can log on and engage development through his course titled Peace Building in High Risk Communities in South Africa. As an open education resource, you can adapt this course for your own context and share this incredibly powerful community development tool. Hi, my name is Earl Albert Mentor, born and bred in Ocean View, a small, close-knit community in Cape Town, South Africa. I am an anti-bias and racial equity facilitator and solution-focused life coach offering intensive and brief intercultural workshops and seminar style peace building sessions to help bring about positive change within previously disadvantaged communities. I have more than 18 years of experience working in the social and personal development industry, helping communities manage conflict and diversity. I am the founder and director of a peace building organization called Mentoring Peace Builders South Africa, an affiliate of PGM Foundation. The Open Education Influencer online course inspired me and I have now been offered an opportunity to create my very own online training course through the support of my mentors. My online course intends to assist adult advisors in delivering peace building content inside the classroom, which might help learners contextualize peace building knowledge in the real life situation. Therefore, assisting students in having a sense of social responsibility and cultural awareness at an early stage in their professional lives. Thank you for the opportunity. Over to you, Earl. I think maybe we can just say goodbye. Um, this has been so powerful. And as far as our collaboration, I couldn't be more, more proud and also I'm, I'm actually really overwhelmed right now at the wonderful work that you've done. Thank you, Gino. So just on my side, by closing off our time, I'm excited um, and thank you for the opportunity. Over to you, Chester. Hala la, wow, oh, we are so, that is great work. Yes, I love it if you know Cape Town, Ocean View, that's great work that Earl's doing. I'm very excited to hear about that. I'm going to go check that out myself. So a round of applause in the comment section for, for the great work from Earl and the whole team there. Wow, yes, we love you guys. We love you. It's bonkers. We love, we love you. We love you. That's how we get people to understand South Africa, one storytelling at a time. And on that note, I'd like to invite an actual person studying anthropology properly. Bianca Masuku, are you on the call? Please turn on your mic. Uh, and camera we want to talk to you bianca how's it going the junior research fellow in the dot 4d project at uct you're at uct i am i am at UCT. wow do, do you go air a lot i don't i don't think i've picked up you know that that's 
Good. That trip, That's because yes. you're studying yeah. anthropology. That sack yeah. leaf roads must fall. Good for you. I love it. I'm going to hand over to you. You're going to talk about journey into open textbooks. Take it yes. away, Bianca. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I'm just getting my slides together. Okay, can everybody see? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna stop my video and, and present it that way. Let's see if I can do that. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for having me. Uh, as has been said, my name is Bianca Masubu, and I'm a researcher at UCT, based uh, in the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching, which is SILT. And the title uh, of my presentation today is Journeying into Open Textbooks. And it's really about how academics at UCT are venturing into producing open textbooks. There we go. Okay, so the work that I'm presenting today emerges from the, the dot for d project, the Digital Open Textbooks for Development project, which is a research advocacy and implementation initiative based at UCT. And the project aims to contribute to improving inclusion in South African higher education by addressing equitable access to appropriate and relevant learning resources. And the hypothesis that it presents is that open textbooks have the, have the potential to contribute and enhance social justice in teaching and learning through inclusive content development strategies. And so pictured in this slide are members of the Dr. D team. We have Dr. Glenda Cox, who is the PI of the project. We have Michelle Wilmers, who is the publishing and implementation manager. And then we have myself as the project's uh, researcher. And together we bring different kinds of expertise into the project from our, our very different backgrounds um, and research experiences. However, I being quite new to the field, only having really started engaging with open education three years ago when I joined the project, I saw my role as the researcher in the, in, in the DOPD project as a really great opportunity to understand what open textbooks are and the role that they play. So the project has three main areas of focus, each with its own specific aims and objectives, but all existing in a complex and really interrelated relationship as the activities in each of these areas impact and inform each other. So the work that happens in the research arm shapes engagement with the grants program and the grants program feeds back into the research work. And both of these inform the work that then takes place in the advocacy component of the project. And so the research arm aims to articulate and identify the options for open textbook approaches which contribute to a social justice agenda. The grant arm of the project aims to support open textbook publishing activity at UCT through the project's grant program. And the advocacy arm aims to inform current uh, textbook publishing policy development initiatives at institutional and national levels. The project is underpinned by a social justice approach. And Prof. Magwe gave us a really great breakdown of this in her presentation. Um, and here the project also draws similarly from uh, Nancy Fraser's conception of social justice and her trivalent lens, which highlights a, a, an intricate entanglement of this, the, the economic and cultural and political dimensions of inequality and injustice that are present in classrooms at UCT and has allowed the project to critically examine the role of open textbooks in trying to address these issues. This presentation today will be focusing specifically on the research arm of the project. And so in focusing on the research arm, I will be showing the various uh, research processes that, we, that have been undertaken by the project in order to form a better understanding of open textbooks, to articulate open textbooks, open textbook approaches, and understand the role that they can play in addressing injustices in the classroom. And so what I'm presenting today is what I'm calling three key research moments. Uh, these are the project's open textbook landscape survey, its case study process, and the work undertaken around open textbook production. 
all of which comprised of various research activities and methodological approaches to generate data for the project. And so coming in as a novice in the field and driving the groundwork of the research arm of the project, I was afforded an opportunity, an opportunity to navigate and make sense of what open textbooks are and their significance through each research activity we undertook and through interactions and engagements with open textbook authors and practitioners in the project. Uh, so this slide here shows the cohort of academics that formed the sample for the dot for d study. And this sample comprised largely of uh, grantees from the dot for d grants program. And as you can see, the authors that we worked with engaged, oh, sorry, emerged from various disciplines um, and represented very different contexts and also presented very varied levels of expertise in their field. And so through our different research activities, the project shows the varying approaches that authors used in the production of their open textbooks and the different degrees of success that they were able, achieve, able to achieve in their context. I begin here with a discussion of our open textbook landscape survey. So the landscape survey was part of the project's foundational work and was an initial attempt to scope the open textbook climate at UCT. And this work was motivated by an imperative to survey the institutional open textbook publishing terrain in order to gain a sense of current open textbook production and publication activity at UCT. The aim was also to produce an openly licensed baseline data set on open, open textbook activity, which could be utilized in further research and advocacy activity within and beyond the university. Uh, and the method that we used for this landscape survey was a desktop review approach, whereby I immersed myself in the various institutional repositories to, to conduct an online search to look for resources that were identified as open textbooks um, in, in their titles, either in their titles or in their met metadata. And we probed key features um, which, which were captured in, an, in a, a processing spreadsheet. And I've linked both of these um, iterations of our spreadsheets here, if anyone is interested. And so the key features we were looking at were type of resource, um, the authors or author affiliation, uh, who the resource was compiled by, the year of publication, uh, findability, peer review and quality assurance processes in these resources, the inclusion of multimedia, amongst many other features. And so the, the desktop uh, review component was conducted over two cycles. As you can see, the spreadsheets have two different dates. The initial cycle was in 2019, and this was followed by a second cycle in 2021, in which the same online searches of the institutional repositories were conducted in order to confirm these resources that were originally found and to surface new resources that had been produced in the interim. Um, so from this, we were able to compile a landscape survey report. And the report really helped us to provide a summary of our key findings and insights from the, the survey work um, that we found particularly interesting for understanding open textbook production present within the UCT landscape. And so these graphics here capture some of these findings. So we were able to see, we were able to find 39 open textbooks all emerging from different disciplines that are listed there. There were also various types of resources identified with some labels, some labeled as books, some were eBooks, manuals, monographs. And there were also various kinds of licenses being used for these resources. I've also added a link to the report there for further reading. In addition to this, there was also evidence of quality assurance and some kind of peer review mechanism in these resources. These resources also existed in different formats. Some were PDFs, some were combinations of other formats, and they were available through different platforms. And so the survey revealed that a number of academics were engaging in open textbook publishing at UCT. And in 2021, there were clear signs that this production was continuing with the project, with the dot for d project aiding and facilitating some of this production through its grants program. 
not only were we getting a sense of the activity taking place, but we were also getting a sense or a getting insight into what open textbooks actually look like and what their various features and characteristics were. And so drawing from this foundational work that the project was able to conduct, we were able to arrive at an, emer an emerging definition of what open textbooks are. And so our definition reads that open textbooks are digital, freely available collections of scaffolded teaching and learning content published under an open license on platforms and in, form and in formats that provide affordances for content delivery on a range of devices, the integration of multimedia and incorporation of content from varying sources through collaborative authorship models. And in some instances, they also provide affordances for print and low bandwidth access strategies. So the survey answered the question of what and, and where. However, this next section started to, to answer the question of why and who. Who are the people getting into this work? Why are they choosing open textbooks as the resource, as resources and tools of choice? And what are these res what can these resources do? What role do they actually play in the classroom? And so in the case study process, the project wanted to examine how academics involved in open textbook authoring and publication activity at UCT were planning and implementing and reflecting on their activities. So here, I conducted two sets of in-depth interviews with five academics that were purposely um, identified and who were also part of our cohort of grantees. So the first set of interviews was focused mainly on surfacing you know, key details on historical legacy, disciplinary norms, content development approaches, and you know, motivations. The second interview was focused on points of clarification and reflection around um, curriculum transformation and decolonization. And so in these interviews, myself and, and my partic the participants had these very long conversations where I was able to engage with these, them as practitioners and get an understanding of their work and what, and what they were trying to achieve. But this process also served as a reflexive exercise for them to think deeply about what their, what their work was and talk about the, the different shifts in their thinking and in their strategies as they were developing their, their, um, their textbooks. So the case studies draw on data arising from both qualitative and quantitative research activities and enables the project to capture the, the nuances of a range of open textbook production models and conduct an exploration of, uh, textbook publish, of the textbook publishing landscape and the individuals who are participating in it. And so from this set of interviews and the, the various other research activities that we use to support this work, we discovered that open textbook authors are motivated by particular drivers and imperatives. The ones that surfaced in our work were mainly affordable access, curriculum transformation, multilingualism, and pedagogical innovation. Um, and these key imperatives map to the dimensions presented in Fraser's work on social justice and informed the different decisions and strategies that authors were using in conceptualizing and in the production of their textbooks. And so with this work, we mapped our findings to Fraser's social justice dimensions. In terms of economic injustices, what we found was that academics at UCT are aware of the challenges related to cost and utility um, of traditional uh, textbooks and are experimenting with new approaches towards resource creation through open practice. Open textbooks here in this case, therefore presented this potential to disrupt histories of exclusion in South African higher education institutions by addressing issues of cost and marginalization through the creation of you know, these more affordable, contextually relevant learning resources and promote a more socially just uh, approach to materials creation and provision in the South African uh, higher education system. 
In terms of cultural injustices, open textbook authors were attempting to make content more accessible in terms of relevance, language, format, and genre in order to promote greater inclusivity. So strategies that authors employed in their pedagogical approaches informed their perceptions of the possible cultural affordances of their open textbooks. These perceived affordances included um, the ability of the open textbook to serve as a platform or mechanism through which to address cultural issues of relevance and incorporate multiple voices. With regards to political injustices, academics at UCT acknowledge that there is and there was and still is a legacy of gatekeeping in the selection of prescribed textbooks, which serve to perpetuate political misframing and exclusion. Um, as such, they are including students in the content development processes in order to shift these power dynamics and build confidence in terms of students' abilities to contribute. And so strategies that the authors employed politically challenge the status quo and shift power dynamics and counter existing publishing models. So what we're seeing here is how open textbooks are being understood and used as very important tools in the classroom to address a range of issues and injustices experienced by students and how authors are trying to democratize not only the teaching and learning process um, or relationship, but the creation and production of knowledge. And so, although this case study process was giving us a good sense of the motivations and practices of open textbook authors and the injustices that they were, you know, uh, that they were working to address, one last part of the picture that was missing, which is what I'm going to touch on in this next uh, uh, section, was an understanding of the strategies being used by open, uh, open textbook authors to actually produce these important resources. So that brings us to our exploration here of open textbook production. So as an extension of the case study process, the project worked towards surfacing and articulating um, open textbook production and publishing models that are being employed at UCT. The project utilized a combination of qualitative and quantitative research activities again here. And this was conducted with the 11 uh, academics who received grants, uh, Dofferty grants in our grants program and one open textbook practitioner at UCT. And so the table in the slide shows a list of our grantees and the different projects that they, that they started and the various kinds of outputs that they were able to achieve within the grant period. So this work was really about understanding and showcasing how this kind of work is actually done. And so that is how we came up with this idea of what we've called open textbook journeys of these uh, cohort of academics. What motivated this set of work was this imperative to tell the stories of academics who are undertaking this work and to really profile them. The journeys concept emerged from exploring the various aspects and components involved in authors conceptualization, production and publishing of open textbooks. So in order to capture these varied experiences, we drew from various data sources in order to trace the, traje the trajectory of their journeys. And so this involved drawing from um, the grant proposals that uh, th this cohort of academics initially sent sent in for the grants program and their envisioned the the way in which they envisioned and planned and articulated their plans in those in in the proposals um, we also drew on field notes that were captured by our, our implementation and publishing manager in the various interactions that we had with our grantees we 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 made use of survey data um, and we also made use of grant closure reports that were submitted at the end of the grant period so this diagram here reflects the many different stages or components or what I've called elements here that emerged within our academics or our cohorts, um, different initiatives or different open textbook projects. All of them started with an original plan, um, which was their articulation of what their open, textbook, um, open textbooks were going to be about and what particular issues they were trying to address. And from that point, 
depending on their motivations and the issues they wanted to get to, they made particular decisions around authorship and content development. And they, they had different ideas about how they wanted to involve students in their process. Uh, they had strategies around publishing and the tools used, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And in some of these cases, things, you know, you can have a, a set plan coming in, but in some of these cases, things didn't go as planned in their journeys. And in a few instances, some authors had to quit their processes, you know, due to varied reasons. And so in the telling of these journeys, this collection that we've, we've come up with here um, of these stories captures the granular details of academics' endeavors as relates to open textbook development. And it reveals their, their thoughts and reflections as they navigate uh, the different aspects of this process. So the journeys we present, and we're working towards having a completed collection or a, a monograph that will be published um, in collaboration with the, uh, the UCT libraries. And so what we're presenting in that monograph here really highlights the complexities of you know, conceptualizing and creating open textbooks and the challenges that authors face. You know, despite the highs and the lows of the process, the heroic efforts of these academics, and, and it truly is heroic efforts, um, undertaking this work with very limited funding and other forms of institutional support is really a testament to their desire to improve the learning and uh, to, to improve the learning experience for their students. And so for academics, our hope is that each journey will provide insight into the varied ways in which the task of open um, textbook production can be undertaken, the different outcomes that can be produced and the lessons that can be learned. And of course, in this work, we're also really thinking about students as well. And we want them to start considering themselves as co-creators of their knowledge and to seize opportunities to get involved um, with the production of open textbooks and other open educational resources. And so in speaking to the themes you know, of the colloquium, I see today's presentation speaking to you know, two themes, uh, the first being hashtag disrupt and the second being hashtag develop. So in terms of disruption, I feel that the DOFRD program and its research endeavors are showing a disruption of antiquated practices through the pursuit and advocacy around socially just approaches to teaching and learning, um, such as you know, open textbooks. And in this regard, open textbooks are being shown to have the potential, again, I'm repeating this, to have the potential to address social injustice in South African higher education, um, especially with regards to high costs, costs of textbooks for students, the need for curriculum transformation, and the inclusion, the very important inclusion of student voices in their own learning. In terms of uh, development, the project and the grants program that it facilitated with open textbook authors allowed for an opportunity, or has allowed for an opportunity to work collaboratively with authors in very meaningful ways and foster an engaged community of practice around open textbooks and their production and publishing. And so just to say in closing, and so you know, reflecting on having driven the various aspects of the project's research, the reason why I chose to title this this um, presentation, Journeying into Open Textbooks, is because it's been a journey for myself as well. Coming in as someone who was you know, very new to the field and conducting the groundwork of this project um, research, I was afforded this opportunity to navigate and make sense of you know, what open textbooks are and their significance through every single research activity that we undertook. And I've also, you know, in this process, been finding my voice as a researcher within this landscape. And I believe that the inclusion of young Black researchers like myself into the space and into broader conversations about open is both a form of disruption as it allows for different voices, perspectives, skills, and experiences to be included and entered into the conversation around social justice. But it is also a moment for development as it is a form of capacity building within the field and can encourage and should be encouraging a new era of researchers and practitioners to, to, to emerge. 
And that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for having me and I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. We loved your presentation. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. Please give it up for Bianca in the comment section. Thank you, Bianca. You're absolutely right. The more black academics take over and come express alternative points of view to the dominant narrative, that's what we need. A round of applause for that. Thank you. As we say, never, never learn to go air. The moment you <laughs> don't go down to Ronda Bosch, it's very dangerous. No. It's in the Nando's there. Like, the moment you eat it, it puts Gareth Cliff inside you. Like, That's, you walk around cliffing everything. Thank you, Bianca. Great to talk to you. I'm gonna Thank ha you. Have a great rest of your day. Make sure you get hold of Bianca. Uh, we put her information in the comment section there as far as the dot 4D project. And I'm going to hand over once again to my friend Gino uh, Franzmann, who has just, I don't think, has given himself enough chances to talk today. I think we need to give him another chance to say hello. So, Gino, turn on your camera and microphone. Where are you? He's, I think he's on holiday. There you are with your wonderful dish cloth. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for Gino. <laughs> Look, Chester. Um, I love you, my guy. I love you. So where did you get your shirt? Be honest. You had some curtains. You thought, let's not throw things away. <laughs> it, it's been repurposed as one of the five R's of open. I embody the movement. That's it. Thank Even you. your clothing is open education clothing. You're a genius. Yes. I love it. Take it away, Gino. I'm up. <laughs> Thanks, Chester. Um, okay, Bianca, firstly, I'd, I'd like to say thank you so much. Um, the work that you and Glenda and Michelle are doing at UCT in the dot for d program uh, is, is just amazing. And um, I've been privileged to be able to collaborate lots and lots with you and to be part of this open textbook network that we are setting up along with Prof Foxcroft here at Mandela Uni. Um, we are so excited. So I'm going to go through um, a very quick presentation because time is against us and also just make an announcement that we won't be having an eat and greet. I think that this has been so rich that um, I feel full, like literally full because of open education. And if you could see earlier on, um, I, 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 I literally started to become so almost overwhelmed emotionally because of just of, of the power of old work and everything that has been contributed so far. So I, I really want to say thank you. Um, um, just like so authentically, um, thank you to everybody for, for coming and for joining and for, for contributing to what's turned out to be um, a really powerful um, event. So thank you. I'm going to share my screen and a lot of what I am sharing right now, I've actually done um, because I, I shared some of, of, of this content a bit earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm actually just, just going to skip through some of these slides. So this is about the open education influences. It's about the becoming an open influencer, um, an open education influencer or Bowie. That's how we say it. And an open ed influencer is shortened to OE. Right. So the Bowie Empowerment course, as I shared before, is on the Engage.Mandela um, website. And you are welcome to send me an email and I can enroll you. I can enroll groups of people. You don't have to be registered. You don't have to be a student. You don't have to be in education. The six modules for Bowie, I will explain. And then after doing that, I, I really want to just uh, make an, a, a rather exciting announcement because Firstly, where is this thing? Oh, maybe I should go to my own presentation. So we are funded by the Sia Pumalela project and Sia Pumalela means we succeed. Um, at Mandela Uni, uh, we are fortunate enough, we've got a few projects underneath the Sia Pumalela funding umbrella and the Open Education Influences uh, is one of those projects. So it's allowed us to really be able to pay for people to engage in the research about open, about open education, but more so it also allows us to support professional development of our student advocates. 
So the open education uh, influences, you'll see that logo there, and the hands almost touching because this is education uh, being opened up via advocacy. And advocacy is about doing, not just about saying. So the open ed influences, why is this thing still on my screen? My apologies. Well, um, they are ambassadors for, for change in education who increase awareness of open education resources and open education practices. Always facilitate the adoption, creation, and licensing of open education resources, or OER. They energetically advocate for the use of open textbooks, like Bianca was just presenting about, and these are across purpose, across faculties and schools. So again, I think that earlier on someone mentioned that open shouldn't just be thought of for higher education. And it's something that I've been advocating for for a long time. I think open means access to quality resources, to opportunities for development, but also opportunities to share resources that are going to help change society not just in higher education, not just in primary or basic education, but for the purpose of educating others. So this was our 2018 team you see there, Sumaya, Kirsty, Kelly, and I. Then in 2019, we uh, expanded and included Nomawetu. Nomawetu is now at Stellenbosch University. In 2020, uh, Lungisi Mflongo, who is in the hills of KZN right now, but he is here, um, joined our team, as well as Ntemesha Maseka. In 2021, Molya Vundamina, our wonderful Molya, joined us. So um, really, the open education influences aim is to empower people, and you are all people, to activate their goals by doing something about it. We operate by looking at the sustainable development goals and seeing how can we facilitate the realization of these goals that governments across the world have actually agreed as the 17 important elements that we should try to focus on. Of course, education is a vehicle that uh, empowers the realization of all of these goals. So we created an online empowerment course, which, like I said, is freely accessible and on the engage.mandela.ac.za website. It's called Bowie, Becoming an Open Education Influencer. There are six modules in Bowie. The first is Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a philosophy of sharing. It's an African sort of um, philosophy that says, I am because we are. At Mandela Uni, we, we speak about a humanizing pedagogy because we're not dealing with inanimate objects. This is not artificial intelligence. We are dealing with people. So Ubuntu speaks about an authenticity in direction, in directives, in education. The next module is open. So when you take this uh, the course, we want you to be at the end of each of these modules, well-versed, but empowered, not just thinking about something, but being able to go out and do. And in order to go out and do, we've got the advocacy module. How do you speak about something? Then we have facilitation. Facilitation helps you to speak in an online reality. So we've got COVID and, and the real, reality that COVID has now sort of demanded of us is um, an online sort of presence, right? So the facilitation module helps both in an online sort of advocacy uh, endeavor, as well as in a face-to-face, -face, or as we say now at Mandela Uni, mask to mask um, sort of situation. Then we've got influencing. How do, how do students speak to lecturers um, and have them listen? How, how, how do we cross these power dynamics that very often disable real communication and real change, not just in education, but in development? So the influencing module helps you to move somebody's sort of perspectives, ideas, maybe beliefs from one point to another. And then we look at the sustainable development goals. Why? Because we live in the world. We are not just in Kreberge. Uh, we are not just in Rondebosch like Conrad and Chester, um, we, we situate ourselves in the world. And this module helps you to situate whatever initiative, endeavor that you are going to be engaging with globally. 
So this is how, um, like Andrew showed before, um, the, the Bowie course looks on the engage.mandela.ac.za website. And we quickly understood and learned um, that in order to do this, it wasn't just going to be about putting a whole bunch of text on a page or online. Students are tired of reading. COVID's made me exhausted of being in front of a computer. So the engagement factor needed to be really high. And how did we do that? We curated videos and text and images from all over the world. And these are all open education resources. These are all openly licensed. So you can take what you need and you can recreate this course. The five steps for enrolling into Bowie are very similar to the five steps for, well, six steps, for, for um, enrolling into the peace building in high-risk communities in South Africa course that all presented earlier. Just a quick something. So some students have spoken about their experience with um, Bowie, with the course now in 2021. We've had um, the first year uh, success uh, student leaders who are responsible for sort of um, facilitating entry into the university for first years. And one of the students spoke about um, the Ubuntu module, and I'm going to read this. The content of the module is very insightful. I had a simple one layer definition of what Ubuntu is, and that was solely based on the explanation I'd received from my parents and the interactions I've had growing up. The information in the modules opens up a whole new idea of what Ubuntu is and still maintains the core beliefs of what I learned as an African child. I found that so powerful because, yeah, we all come from different um, spaces. And in Africa, in South Africa, we've got so many different cultures. So this is a really um, powerful sort of a reflection of, of one of the modules. About the open module on open education resources. I had no idea what this meant. And after watching the videos and reading the notes, I now know what it is. But I am very surprised that the education system in South Africa is not exploiting this cost-effective and efficient way of delivering high-quality education. Yes, there are issues of intellectual property, but I believe the ideal of Ubuntu can possibly solve this issue. I'm enjoying the process. I love seeing what people say about the course. So... We've got um, a video that we actually made. Well, we've got several videos. And, and the series was called Made During Lockdown because we did all of this as COVID hit last year. And we collaborated and we made this. Um, we've got a, a, a video here and the link is here. I hope that one of the, the um, influencers would just post this link into uh, the chat so that others can also access it. The video is called Open Textbook advocacy at Mandela Uni. And really, it, it reflects on us having done research with our students and finding out only a third of them are actually buying textbooks. What are the other three, um, um, two thirds doing? It's so concerning. And the reality is that very often there are sort of contravening copyright laws in order to access material, in order to, to reproduce what's in um, a textbook that's really too expensive for them. In one of the modules that we did research into, there's a textbook for four and a half thousand rand with 70% of our students at our university on the NASFAS government sort of subsidy, which, which um, subsidizes their education. It pays for their education. They get a 5,000 rand allowance for textbooks for the year. That one textbook where they are only using, I think, two chapters out of 14 or 16 chapters in that book in one quarter out of four quarters in that year. That's wrong. It's wrong. We need to do better. We need to look at open textbooks. This is social justice. So what are we doing at the university? Well, for about staff development and then to just promote access to high quality, original, and also location specific teaching and learning resources. In 2021, we've had two times 20,000 rand support grants. And our very own uh, colleague from learning development, Dr. Philip Kitching, is almost, I think, 80% of the way through his fellowship year, um, creating a self-coaching open textbook for Tutuka students, which is a national uh, program for accountancy students around South Africa. 
it's it's an amazing experience and the work is phenomenal it is all open education resource based it is openly licensed and it will be available for everyone you are able to access this book as soon as we publish it then in 2022 we have 200,000 rand from the Siapumalela project. And that means that we are going to be having eight fellowships plus having some consulting support. So Bianca's here on behalf of Dot4D. We are definitely collaborating with Dot4D going forward with our fellowship. The primary aims in 2021 and 2022, it's awareness raising and empowerment for academic staff to adopt, but more importantly, to create OER and to put this into the praxis of learning and teaching at Mandela University. So we recruit, we recruit two academic staff now, and then next year we recruit eight staff. This doesn't just have to be academic staff, however. Textbooks and open textbooks can be generated from staff across our um, membership or our community. We want to empower staff with Bowie. So you take the course and you actually get paid to complete the course. At the end of uh, doing Bowie, you get a certificate of completion. You get a digital badge you can put onto your LinkedIn profile, which says that you've completed all of the modules. We then facilitate and guide towards suitable OER that you can use to create your open textbook. We're not going to leave you on your own. The Open Education Influences team will help you like they've helped Dr. Kitchen to curate and embed these resources into your own textbook. And then we want to generate learning and teaching materials in specific disciplines for definite pedagogical use within the curriculum. This is all about helping our students, but it's also about making content that speaks from South Africa, from like Conrad says, Tebeha, and it, 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 it's got Tandi, it's got Mohammed, it's got a Philip, it's got a Kelly, it's got our names and our people and our places. So if you want to collaborate, this is the invitation to all of you. Collaborate and join create. Please reach out. From my side, that's it for now. And I'm going to give you over to Conrad just before uh, we do a closing of the event. Thank you. Oh, there, I must turn my, always my mic there. Halala, Gino, what great work you're doing. Give it up for Gino and his open ed shirt. We love it. Well done, Gino. Great work, guys. Great work. And before we go any further, because we've run out of time, I'm going to ask Prof Foxcroft, Cheryl Foxcroft, to turn on her mic and camera and come say a word or two. Come decolonize this business here, Cheryl. Foxcroft, come bring it. Bring it. Bring your edge. Bring your homemade clothing. Come on, do it. Where is she? Is she got ran right. out of data? Are you there? No, no, I'm right here. I'm right here, Chester. That's great. Kabeh um, away. That's it. And I'm unfortunately I don't have any um pictures for you to look at now. Um it's okay. I'll call but I've just quickly put a few thoughts down. I'm not going to go into detail because I know we uh, stretched for time, but possibly we can share this with the participants so that people can add to it. Because I tried to find some key themes. I came up with four that are coming out of today that we could use in our advocacy work, for example. So the one is around changing mindsets. I think it's more than raising awareness. We actually need to change mindsets by making a case for open ed resources. I love the idea that we should situate this case in what the future for education is, because that's the big talk in the education sector at the moment. What will higher education look like post COVID? So to actually make the case for open ed in this moment, I think is a very opportune one. And to link it as well to the social justice ethos of many universities in, in our country and in the world, I think is incredibly powerful to do as well. And that can also link to the student-centric ethos of universities. Um, we learned a lot today about students are holistic beings. It's not just about the intellectual academic experience, but it's their emotional experiences as well. We learned a lot as well about how we can use the development of OERs, researching them, researching the journey, 
to actually then use that to make a case with academics. When they see a colleague that has done something like this, they're less likely to say it can't be done in our context. And then lastly, on this point, is just understanding what the barriers are for academics if we want to change mindsets. Second theme, a lot came out around partnerships. As Gina has just been sharing around using our students as influencers and activists, for open education and the resources, with students collaborating with academics to develop resources, but also students developing OERs for their peers, because often that happens organically and some of that work could actually be turned into something that gets a creative common license, etc. And also partnerships with colleagues around the world, as we saw good examples of today, for example, the storybook. And it seems to be just so much more fun when you're working with your colleagues also learned about policies and co-creating those policies, but importantly, that they need to be resourced and monitored for impact. Um, and the comment about the map is not the territory is so important. You can have a wonderful policy, but about resourcing, implementing, monitoring it. Governance issues need to be included in some of the policies as well. And then also that we, again, this participatory nature of the work should come into our policies and the networks that are formed because that certainly enhances things. Last two, two themes, the one is around sharing, which also came out very strongly for me and whether it was locally, nationally or globally, um, because it is through this that we actually achieve sustainability by giving wide access to affordable resources for large numbers of people. Um, there's also the imperative to open access for success to all, which sharing resources makes possible. But this also includes sharing reflections and other outputs and engaging with and expanding and remixing those outputs as a means to inspire and motivate others. So through sharing, we also do some of that advocacy work in making the case for open. And then lastly, I, I learned a new term. I've been talking about repositories, but creating OER libraries is essential. And we had this wonderful presentation on AI-powered um, OER libraries, which sounds absolutely amazing to me. And it can be adaptive, for example, Learning pathways can be created through them. We can address language barriers. So I'm just so excited about that and the key themes that have emerged. And I look forward to you collaborating with me. Um, I'll get Gina to help me there as we maybe refine those themes so that we've got an output of today. Thank you very much, Chester. Thank you very much to all the colleagues who've engaged today. Thank you, Prof. You were great. It was great to talk to you. Thank you. It's been wild. You guys have been fantastic. We need to wind this up. Okay, bro, I think we need to say thank you. So you didn't answer my question. Are you racist? <laughs> is my mic on? Yes, it is. Uh, well, I, it's not the place for only because, you know, you're going to, as Gino said, 3,000 Rand for a textbook when they only got a 5,000 Rand budget, you're going to upset some publishers. That's the one thing we could talk more about is power, is white people. I don't know if it's white people. It's white people. It's not. Listen, we're all African. What? We're all African. Really? Are you African? Actually, come on, dude. You're African. You're a white South African. You're African in the same way as tomatoes are a type of fruit. It's true that nobody gives a damn. Okay, that's, come on. I'm, I'm African. Really? Okay, Mr. African. How many African languages do you speak? What? I and mean, then you're going to talk about decolonizing. That's the issue, isn't it? That's the power dynamic. So, I mean, no, not that, not that cuck you do at the garage. I mean, actually speak. In fact, let's go all in. How many African languages can you name? Let's do it. People watching, hey? English, Afrikaans, you always start with those two. Kosa, as I call it in Constantia. Kosa, Zulu, Sutu, Teri, Tswana, what's next? Uh, again, Mendoza, was he a language? No, he was a person and he spoke in Kalakata. 
okay, bro, or, you know, we, we are all part of this country. You need to work. I know that you need to acknowledge the tar dynamics that start open education that are happening. That's all I'm saying. And then can you sing the national anthem? Of, of course I can. I'm just a bad singer. Oh, he doesn't know the words. He's like, he sings the national anthem like a rugby player. You know how rugby players is? Africa. Okay, guys, let's wind this up with something honest then, okay? Let's do this. Do you want me to apologize for apartheid? Yeah, do it. No, we're on a platform here. You can't make me do it now. No, do it. Do it. We want to see you do it. Come on, do it a clack. Do it. My friends, I am deeply sorry about apartheid. Did you see that? What? Nothing happened. It changed absolutely nothing. It just let your conscience off the hook. What do you want me to give? G give Gino, give Gino Thransen on your house. Come on, dude. Even Outsurance paid something back. Okay, you're talking about justice. Social justice. Exactly. Thank you very much. You guys are great. We've got to end this uh, um, on a positive note. Uh, it is a positive note. You know the only you know the only two white South Africans the world knows. Two. Yeah, yeah. Charlize Theron and Esco and, and, and Oscar Pistorius. <laughs> Hey, isn't that amazing? Oscar was a monster. Charlie's acted in a movie called Monster, and then she won an Oscar. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, you need to go in your PPE because we're safe uh, at Nelson Mandela University. What are you doing? You've got to go in your PPE. Dude, I am a PPE. You can't put a PPE in a PPE. No, no, help me. <laughs> Gino. <laughs> Decolonize him. <laughs> Dude, you guys know I don't breathe. You've got to go, no, help. Thank you very much to my colleagues and friends. This is amazing work you're doing. It is the cutting edge of making South Africa an accessible, just place for everyone. Sia bonge in Kosi, kia leboche. My name is Conrad Koch. Please give a going for, for Gino Franzman and his whole team. What amazing work you guys are doing. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> Yeah.